Hello and welcome. I'm Marianne Fessenden from AMTS and this is the Nutritionist webinar. Thank you for joining us for our sixth year. We are doing something a little different this season. We are taking it outside. When we did a webinar last fall with Tom Taluki, he decided everyone was probably tired of head and shoulders presentations and gave us a farm tour. The combination of cows, Tom's openness to show the good, the bad, and the fixable was a real winner. It inspired us to make the 2021 season a year of farm tours. We're going to be taking you to cows around the world. We have presentations from the Northeast to Midwest USA, tours of Brazilian, Russian, South African, UK, Italian, and Canadian farms with the nutritionists working them. We are also hosting two sheep nutrition-focused webinars in March and April. Look to the AMTS 2021 The Nutritionist webpage for our schedule. For all of the talks offered at two times, we have pre-recorded the presentation for the convenience of the presenter. We will take live questions at the end. I have co-hosts from various countries helping provide global perspective to the questions. Depending on how you are listening, you can submit queries through me or one of my attending co-hosts. We will read them and ask the presenter for you. After the webinar and question sessions are complete, I compile, process, and upload to archived videos and podcasts available on the AMTS website under the Webinar and Resources tab, respectively. Today, we are joined by Dr. Tom Taluki, CEO of AMTS. Tom was raised on a 65-cow dairy farm in eastern New York State. He attended Cornell University, where he received his B.S., Master's, and Ph.D. in animal science. Tom's Ph.D. work focused on predicting phosphorus excretions of cattle and implementing Six Sigma quality control principles on commercial dairy farms. Upon completing in 2002, he continued with the development of CNCPS and began consulting with feed industry. In 2005, he left Cornell University to start Agricultural Modeling and Training Systems, LLC, AMTS. As a co-inventor of CNCPS, Tuluki has been focused on ensuring the core biological model is implemented correctly for day-to-day -day ration formulation. In his role at AMTS, Tom, his partners Caroline, VJ, and Lynn, and their team develops, trains, and provides nutritional technical support for nutritionists and feed industry globally. Tom has over 150 publications, including journal articles, book papers, extension articles, and popular press. He is a member of the American Registry of Professional Animal Scientists, where he is a board-certified animal nutritionist. In addition to AMTS, Tuluki is a partner in a large dairy in New York State. His wife, Bonnie, is a veterinarian, and they have two children. They live near Ithaca, New York. After last fall's farm tour, we had many requests asking for Tom to really dig into his process when he walks cows. We decided to have Tom bookend our series this year, only to need to switch Tom and Sam's talks at the end to allow for harvest time and Sam's schedule. A couple of notes about the recording. In a few places, the cold weather presented a particular challenge. One section in specific, the sound was extremely wind, effect, wind affected. I dropped in subtitles for that short section. There are some gimbal rides, swooping, and lens fogging, but these sections are short and the information was valuable, so I kept them in. Enjoy the farm tour and enter questions in the Q&A tab or the chat window as you think of them. This is a more open presentation than usual. Much of the discussion will be question-driven, so we're looking to you to help us with that at the end. So now let's let Tom do the talking. Hi everyone. Welcome to the beginning of the 2021 webinar series. I was supposed to record this video last week, uh, but we got it to the point in New York where we were in the single digits temperature-wise. And since a good part of this is going to be outside, I decided that uh, that was too cold to be walking around doing a video. So instead I put it off till this week, uh, which is the week before it's being aired, and we've had snow. 
Uh, we've had uh, a lot of snow uh, over the last three days. Uh, to give you an idea, I'll show you some of the, the snow drifts around that we have. Uh, but in the last three days here at the farm, we are somewhere in the neighborhood of 27 to 30 inches. Uh, for those of you outside of the U.S., that's about 60 centimeters, 60, 70 centimeters of snow. So everyone's been focused on snow removal. So it's actually a kind of a neat time to do some of this because it, it's we get to see what is normal behavior uh, nothing special, nothing set up. Uh, when we walk through some of these cows, this is what we see on a normal day. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go through, uh, we've had requests from the last one I did to see and, and for me to discuss what I actually do when I walk through cows or when I visit a farm. So I'm going to do some of that. We're going to start with a couple groups of cows. Uh, eventually, we'll get into some of the data on them. Uh, I will probably at some point tell you how much milk these groups are giving. But I want to give you a something to think about right from the beginning. My approach to evaluating a farm is heavily dependent upon systems thinking and quality control thinking. I typically will not ask how much group how much milk a group is giving uh, because if we look at it from a quality control world milk production is the end product that is the output that would be like saying hey ford is only going to look at the quality of their vehicles after it's all put together when in reality, it's all of the intermediate points that are important for controlling. And, and the end product, if we go the, again with Ford, is that vehicle. Whereas for us, the end product is milk. So what we really want to, to be evaluating is what are the various intermediate points. And in the case of cows and dairy farming in general, it's, let's look at the cows, look at, look at the feed bunk, etc. Okay, I'll, like I said, I'll get in showing you some data, but for now, we're going to start walking a couple groups of cows. All right, so I'm outside the truck now. Uh, it's a little bit I don't know how much that ground noise is going to be. But just to give you an idea, these are some of the snow banks. Uh, Give me another perspective. Uh, there's my hat. That snow bank is I can look just I I level to the top of that snow bank. Um, it's not super pretty out folks. But it's okay. So let's walk into this barn. Now the first thing you'll notice when we walk into this barn is the starlings have invaded today. Uh, which isn't surprising with all the snow and all the wind. And they'll eventually head out on us, uh, which will be nice. We'll get a nice picture of them uh, heading out. <laughs> okay, so four row barn. Uh, each group has 120 stalls. And let's go in with this group first. Okay. So, uh, we're getting wind on this end, so you see snow in the stalls, not a lot of cows on this end, which isn't surprising. So what am I doing? What am I looking at when I'm doing these? Okay. My objective. Okay. So, what am I looking at? Okay, how is she laying in her stall? We don't have a lot of cows laying in these in stalls right now, but that's okay. We'll get into some others. She's laying pretty comfortable. Uh, I'll look at hawks. You can see we've got a little bit of uh, rubbing off there. Uh, that could be from this pen. It could be from the pen uh, that she came out of before. 
I'm looking at body condition. Okay. You never hear me talk a lot about these are my target body condition scores. Uh, because to me, doing a target body condition score is, I, I don't really like it because they, uh, if you look at the actual data in terms of body fat composition versus body condition score, it's not very clean. Uh, there's a lot of variability. And, and in reality, I, I deal with three scores. Too thin, too fat, just right. And this group, uh, I'll tell you right now, is our fresh pen. Uh, so all these girls, now it's, it's not a traditional fresh pen where uh, cows would be in here for say a week, two weeks, 20 days. Uh, we may have some cows in here that are, are 40, 50 days. It all depends on, on um, how crowded the other pens are in the, in, in the, in the barns. So uh, we've got a pretty well mix uh, in this group and it, it, it's all animals. First lactation heifers uh, all the way through mature cows. Uh, the diet, I'll show you the diet maybe, uh, but it, it's got a fair amount of starch in it. Um, so let's talk body condition score on these girls. So if we take this girl here, okay, to me, looking at her, I call her, she's what I consider just right. Uh, she's not carrying a lot of excess condition. She's not carrying a lot of visible at all and you know is she a little lame she might looks like she might have a little uh issue with that right rear foot uh so that might be uh part of her uh, this is the first calf heifer and if we look at her um she's fine i like her she might have a little excess but um she actually looks pretty clean when you look at her across her, her top line of there just seems to be some patchiness around her tail head, uh, which is tricky uh, because we could have a similar conditioned heifer if we were in a dry lot uh, that would not show that patchiness or a uh, diet that was heavy in, in hay. Uh, all these cows, the way they deposit body condition, where and when, kind of depends upon the diet as well. Uh, so. It, it's, I take all that into consideration when I'm looking at these girls. <clears throat> uh, we look at these girls throughout here laying, you'll see a fair number of them are, are ruminating. Uh, I'm not sure, I'd look, I think we're getting close. This will be, uh, this group would be going into the parlor here probably in the next 20 minutes, half hour. Uh, so they're starting to congregate down towards that gate. Uh, we actually see, uh, some cows shown estrus in this pen, which is great. Uh, I watch how they walk, watch how they stand. Well, and that cow is standing really well. Um, and I also look at, this may seem a little odd, but how friendly are they? Uh, to me, I think uh, cows like this that are coming up trying to lick me, this is normal cow behavior. This is what I expect to see out of cows. Uh, they are curious, um, they want to know what's in their environment, who's in their environment, and they will come up. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that, that can be said about feeding uh, in relation to this style of, of cow friendliness. Um, I think cows that are subclinical acidotic don't want to be around anybody. It's just like us if we've got heartburn. Uh, and they want to just be left alone. As these girls are curious, be it first calf heifers or, or mature cows. You can see uh, clean, uh, well bedded. Uh, these are mattresses, but we won't talk about that. We're talking cows today. Um, and there go the starlings, uh, all flying nicely out of the barn. Uh, now it is cold in here uh, you can see there is no insulation uh, so these girls are carrying a, a pretty good hair coat it's um, <laughs> okay so overall condition score on these fresh cows 
uh, I'm pretty happy with. Uh, this is this is kind of showing kind of my ideal range. I don't like seeing fat cows. I don't like seeing real thin cows. I like to see a nice uniform uh, group. And, and as we walk down through uh, these cows at the feed rail, uh, you can see that they are pretty consistent uh, in, in terms of where we are on body condition. And we'll take a break while I change pens here. Okay, we're in the next pen now. And these girls, uh, these are the old, old girls. They are fourth and greater lactation. Uh, we'll come in here like 50, 60 days in milk and they may stay here right until they're dried off. So let's, again, condition score. I actually expect to see some more thin cows in this group uh, just because they are the older cows. Um, they seem to self-select uh, in terms of how their what their survivability is. And here's a girl who's um, wow, 79 series. Uh, given that calves are now in the 10,000s, uh, she's probably seventh, seven years old maybe. And look at not carrying any extra condition on her but she was up here eating um, and that's what we tend to see in quite a few places is these old cows tend to be a little bit lighter on condition maybe but they are aggressive in, when it comes to the feed bunk again looking at, at uh, you know just your overall cow behavior you know what are her eyes like you know bright and shiny curious uh, rumen fills um, I don't track rumination as much as a lot of people uh, primarily because I'm out here at different times uh, and I think you need to be really consistent uh, when you're looking at, at rumination counts like that uh, I I tend to like being a little bit more um, irregular uh, it gives me a, a pretty good feeling as to uh, how the cows are doing throughout the, the day and you can see feet feet and legs look good on these girls a uh, little bit of, of scuffing of the hocks in some places but uh, really minor uh, don't really see any cows with swollen hocks um, they are if we watch some of these girls walk uh, they are you know very good locomotion scores <laughs> uh, even though she's covered in, in bird shit she still is a pretty decent looking cow uh, and given that these girls are about 90 minutes away from going into the parlor uh, you can see they're pretty well uh, content resting uh, no one really looking out of control the stalls in here are borderline size wise uh, but we deal with what we are dealt with in cases like this uh, you'll see uh, brushes multiple brushes in all these pens uh, the water tanks are, are shallow uh, and even though this one looks quite dirty uh, it's only uh, the water depth is only about four inches five inches oh so a lot of times I will just spend out here just watching cows but my favorite place to do that is where we'll go next. Okay, my favorite place to be is right here in the feed alley. And I will just spend lots of time watching cows eat. Okay, so this fresh pen, as I said, they're getting close to going into the holding area. So that a lot of them are up and eating. So I'll just stand here and watch and observe their eating behavior. And you'll notice I didn't talk at all about doing 
shaker box stuff. I do shaker boxes for two reasons. One is when I'm looking at harvest, what is our chop length looking like? Is it adequate? The other place, the other time I will do shaker box work is if I'm doing mixer evaluations. Okay. So normal day to day uh, doing a shaker analysis, shaker box analysis, just to look at a TMR. You know, folks, to me, that doesn't make much sense. Uh, that's a lot of make work. Um, the question becomes, are we dealing with uh, mixer problems, mixing time problems, loading errors, dry matter variants? Um, that, that's doing, doing the shaker box on a day-to-day -day basis of a TMR is an end, is, is sort of like looking at milk production. It's the end product. Uh, it's working with the feeders uh, to make sure that protocols are being followed. And working with them when I do a shaker box analysis, a mixer test, uh, so that we can try different things if need be. Um, now, these girls, if we look at this, we will see we are having some sorting problems. Okay? And just watching these girls eat, especially when we get up here, you can see they are being little devils. And if we look at the other pen, you know, we've got, there's a great cow giving us a good example of, of how to sort successfully. Oh, throwing feet around, you know, here's a great hole. Huh. Okay, we can easily see that we're sorting. Now, this bothers me. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but I expected it. Um, we are living with a corn silage right now. Uh, half the corn silage that we're feeding. And there is, uh, in the base diet for these old cows, um, there's over 26 pounds of dry matter of corn silage. Highest I've ever been. Uh, but we've had to, we had to do that this year because of weather and inventories. And because of weather and equipment issues, the corn silage that we are feeding right now, half the corn silage is from 2019 still, thank God. Uh, half of the corn silage we're feeding is from 2020. And the 2020 corn silage we're feeding right now has a dry matter, let me repeat that, a dry matter of 63%. So we did everything we could to not have to add water. Uh, we don't add any water and we are almost out of that that first bunk uh, the stuff we're going to be going into is 47 percent dry matter so these girls have held their acts together extremely well during the, this uh, this period of, of this extreme dry corn silage and you can see we have some pretty long particles i mean i don't even have to screen it to show you to to know that we have some pretty long leaves uh pretty long pieces of stock um the good thing is the kernels were processed very well uh as as it was a a new well new to the farm new chopper it's only a couple years old so the processor was all working right and set right uh, if we had poorly processed corn, we would be in serious trouble. And even with that, if we look at the manure, so let's go in here and just do its good old boot test on, on manure. You know, you can see there's still a lot of corn coming through. Uh, would we benefit some from, from having a wetter TMR adding some water possibly uh, intakes have been going very well though uh, and we were doing this as kind of an, an, ex an experiment to see if we could get away with this dry corn silage without adding water uh, and it looks like we've been relatively successful I'll fill people in uh, on what the girls do when we switch bunks to this wetter silage and that's relative being wetter um it wasn't because the corn was over mature it was we had a drought and we had a, 
couple good frosts that that killed the plants um so it's not like i'm dealing with black layer corn oh girls you're supposed to be eating uh instead you want to say hi say hi to the world cows yep you will be you will be infamous uh next week when people all over the world see you so just observing again i'll just stand here I'll, or right now i'm kneeling in the feed i'll just stay here for 10 15 minutes just watching how these girls react around the feed um, because i can tell so much um, about that are they sorting bad are they uh are they hungry are they do they not like do they not like the feed um are, are they being aggressive are they being uh just happy cows coming up here and having a meal there's a lot of little things like that that uh, are difficult for me to explain to people because they're just uh my observations over years of cow behavior <laughs> really you want to lick the camera she just gave the whole world a kiss uh, <laughs> all right um, if we have questions if there's questions about anything that we're seeing here folks i'll be happy to answer them when we're live with you uh, but the, the, these girls you know for being the oldest hurt cows in the herd uh, <laughs> Uh, they're being they're acting like first calf heifers actually of wanting to, to get right up in here in my face so I think we'll go visit another pen okay so now we're in uh, the other barn uh, this is a six row barn and this first pen that that I'm by is first lactation heifers okay and I'm, I'm looking at the same type of thing uniformity in body condition which as you go through we'll go behind them uh, but they are pretty damn uniform uh, these girls seem to be doing uh, an equal amount of, of sorting again dry matter of that corn silage is a major factor related to that uh, it looks like if we get down here to this end we might see what some of the refusals from yesterday look like. Obviously a protocol was not followed as to getting all the refusals out. Um, and it is an issue, it is following protocols. We see it all over the world, don't we folks? And you can see we're getting a pretty good sorting level here. You know, there's nothing but long particles left. Um, and the majority of those particles that are being sorted out are the long particles of that corn silage. Uh, is it having a negative effect on me in terms of rumen health and, and components? No. Um, we are, it's a safe enough, safe enough diet. I want to say I'm right, right up around that 20, 21% fermentable starch uh, and my uh, I don't remember NDF levels or PENDF levels. We'll have to look. Uh, and milk fat on herds averaging a little over four. So, not super concerned about uh, what I'm seeing there, other than uh, I know the reasons uh, and hopefully we'll be out of it soon. The reason we didn't want to add water, well, first of all, why didn't we add something like whey or molasses? We don't have any tanks. Um, I looked at doing bringing in molasses instead of just doing water. And molasses is uh, around here in upstate New York is more expensive than corn uh, by a lot, uh, especially if we were to put it on a dry matter basis. Uh, so we nixed that idea. Uh, we thought about doing whey, but again, we'd have to put a tank system in and, and like that. And um, especially during this weather, finding a place to do it where we wouldn't be dealing with freezing 
uh, somewhat of a challenge. Uh, we figured we'd go through at least a few months, see how the girls behaved, and if we decided we needed to add a liquid, we would do it. Uh, but from what I've been observing from these girls, I think we're going to try and sneak away without having to do that. So as you can see, the girls were doing a very nice job of visiting us, saying hi. <laughs> Again, these are first calf heifers from calving up till about uh, maybe 200 days in milk. Uh, so the average age in this group is like 23, 24 months. Yes, that's the average age. Okay, we start looking at consistency in body condition score, consistency in size, uh, consistency in manure. Uh, they, we've been doing a, we've been holding a pretty, pretty good consistency on all of that if we look across okay there's some fresh manure uh, <laughs> those girls I know okay so we've been doing pretty good let me step in here alongside of them okay and hold it up so you can see there's a the consistency and size of these heifers uh, there's pretty much you can pretty much run a straight line across all of them. So our growth is pretty consistent on these girls um, Again uh, Looking at them You know look at look at the upright ears the curiosity the uh, Grooming themselves Resting and these girls just came back from the parlor. Uh, this was the last group that came through the parlor. So that's why we have so many up here eating uh, Nobody really <laughs> Yes, we, we, we developed a following, you know, that that's that's my type of following. I don't have people follow me. I have cows So let's see and these girls, you know, we look at hawks, we look at feet, uh, and they look really good. Uh, feet uh, here are trimmed three times a year. Uh, they go through formaldehyde foot bath uh, three times a week. And we did have a problem with warts in the past. Uh, we got that all kind of controlled with the formalin. And that's pretty well where these girls are. What I think we'll do is we'll we'll step over to the next pen. This will be the last pen of cows that we go through today. Uh, they are the late lactation cows, and it's a mixed group. So we'll see if there's a potential for having any fat cows. We'll find them in that pen. Be right back. Okay, so we are in this uh, mixed group pen, uh, late lactation cows. And here's where we'll see some additional body condition score. Um, cows like this cow with the blue X on her. Uh, the farm does go through and preg check before dry off uh, just to just to confirm that they that she didn't slip a calf and no one noticed it. So that gives us a good idea of and she's fat. To me she's too fat. Okay and that, that's an extreme uh, we go through we start looking at some of these other girls you know, and we could go through and look, was she a repro prop, breeder problem, whatever, who knows. Um, here's, you know, just as an idea, here, here's a counterpart of hers that, again, preg check for dry off. And you can see we, we aren't carrying that, kind, that same kind of weight as that other cow did. Uh, for this stage of lactation, uh, and where these girls are, uh, these are the these are the upper average body condition scores that I like to see on cows, especially freestyle cows. Uh, that is to me plenty of reserves for them to come through, uh, versus you know a cow like that that's showing some well well placed fat around that that butt. Um, uh, that just get, makes me worry about problems. Um,
And then again, with the level of corn silage that we're having to feed and the digestibility of the starch, probably seeing a little bit more extra condition than, than, uh, than I would like. But on average, again, that's what we're dealing with, is the average of these groups. Um, I'm not that upset, actually. Uh, it's always the, the, the problem cows when you're trying to do something like this. It's either the really sick cow uh, that you see right away or the really fat cows. Like you, 8346, you are um, huh, comfortably obese. Um, <laughs> but then we have a cow like her following her uh, that, that is in near perfect rig. So some variation... Um, more variation than, I, than I'm used to and than, than I actually like to see. Um, it's got to be, it's got to be these levels of, of, of uh, bypass starch that, that are still going through these cows that are throwing me some extra conditions for like this. Wow. Yeah, I didn't know what I was going to do, folks, and I didn't know what I was going to see. So you're all seeing this live, well, recorded live. <laughs> uh, you're all seeing this, seeing this, me being like, oh crap, we've got some, uh, some little issues here. Uh, oh well, <laughs> such is the life in, in uh, nutrition and farming. Okay, next group. Well, we're done with cows. I want to show you a couple things about how I evaluate looking at calves. Okay, everyone. So we're standing out he here outside of the utility room for the new calf barn. And what do I look at when I'm looking at calves? Well, th this is an interesting day um, because of how cold it is. And we are about two hours, three hours after uh, the noon feeding. And you'll notice that all is quiet. And if we look at these babies, Okay, if we look at these babies in this calf barn, you'll see that they are resting, quiet, no one's screaming, uh, which tells me uh, about the level of milk that they're receiving. If we were to go on a farm that's only feeding two liters or two quarts of, of a 20-20 milk replacer twice a day, you walk out here in the middle of the day, these calves are all up screaming. And it's not because they're healthy, it's because they're hungry and looking for food. These little kids, these little kids are all less than 10 days old, looking at their size. And you can see, um, now even though there's snow, huh? uh, there is calf grain that's been offered to them right away. Uh, here's a little girl that's obviously a little sick. She hasn't drank or didn't drink her noon feeding. Uh, there's one that's been nibbling at calf grain already. Back there sleeping. Uh, and <laughs> to give you an idea of the amount of snow, folks, okay, let's look at these hutches. <laughs> yes, that is, uh, that is a good, uh, good amount of snow on that hutch. Now, the nice thing is that's insulation. <laughs> so if we come around and look inside of these, which I think there's probably calves in here. Oh yeah, there's, there's a baby in there, you know, okay, so clean, dry, lots of bedding, get out of the wind, and yet they want to come out and say hi. So, I'm looking at, what are we seeing in terms of scours, consecutive numbers, okay, now, I'll tell you, if we would have done this three weeks ago on this farm, it would have been a different story. Had a different young stock manager and she was terrible. We were dealing with uh, extremely high calf death loss. Um, and it, it was, farm's gonna be paying for that for, for a couple years. Um, now, this new young lady that we have is phenomenal. <laughs> Even to the point where the, uh, the guy who buys uh, the bull calves from the farm uh, was willing to pay extra uh, this last week because of how much healthier those bull calves were. 
So that that uh that tells you something right there. Ah, uh, I look at you know I'll look at little things. You know we don't have water in front of them right now. Like I said, she just gave them uh we just had their lunch a couple hours ago, so I think she's due back soon to give them water. But calf grains available. They are bedded. They're dry. Ooh, an empty pen, huh? Okay. Look at them in there. They're perky. Feeding these calves high levels of milk changes your, your approach to evaluating calves. Uh, you know, middle of the day, post feeding like this, I actually expect them to be laying down sleeping. Uh, I don't expect them to bump up, jump up, and come running at me screaming. Uh, then I'll also look at little things. Uh, you know, and th th this is, this is, I do this in all the barns actually, uh, and it may sound a little odd, but we know, even though protocols and treatment records and everything say everything should be written down, a lot of the times that these numbers aren't written down. So what do I do? I come in to any of these barns and I'll look in the garbage. Okay, now, like I said, we'd fog up, so which we did. So we'll go out. Okay. So why do I look at the garbage? Well, garbage doesn't lie. Um, we could be dealing with, if I go in there and I see a lot of electrolyte packages, or if I start seeing a lot of uh, calcium bottles, uh, like in the fresh cow area. You know, you can stand there and say, well, how many cows do you treat for milk fever? Well, hell, we didn't treat any. But then you go look and there's uh, 50 bottles, empty bottles in the trash. Yeah, well, that doesn't quite add up. Uh, same with mastitis. I'll be looking for mastitis tubes. I'll be looking for any treatment. I'll go open the drug cabinets. See if they're, what kind of inventory are they carrying? What drugs? Are they being really aggressive with drugs or are they... Uh, just doing more of a minimal approach and, and then again, it's still, I'm looking in the garbage. And I will get the herd manager off to the side and ask them some questions directly. The owners, love the owners, but a lot of times they, don't, they might not be up to date as to what the current problem is. Uh, same with vets. You know, I love vets. Hell, I'm married to a vet. Uh, but we, first of all, we speak different languages and vets are generally dealing with clinical clinicians. I'm saying not vets that are nutritionists, but clinicians typically dealing with the problems of the day. And again, back to systems analysis, the systems approach, the problems of the day are an output. Okay. If I walk onto a farm and see them treating a cow with milk fever, I don't get that, that excited until I start doing some digging and find that, hey, we've had 15, 20% clinical milk fevers in the last week. Okay, now I'll go through and we'll evaluate and possibly make a correction. First of all, see if protocols were being followed. But then once that, that correction was made, I also tell them, I don't expect to see a huge change for two or three weeks. So if I get a phone call tomorrow saying, hey, we just had five more cows with milk fever, no, don't because we can't fix it that fast. So there, there's, I truly believe that we need to be educating our, our not only the owners, but also the managers uh, to be more prepared to, you know, what to expect as to nutritional changes and time that it requires to get responses. All right, so they, this pen, okay? You can see these girls, these are weaned and, you know, Calf grain and water, and yeah, there's a little bit of ice on that water. Um, but again, overall, looking at these girls laying there, ruminating, clean, dry, out of the wind. That's nice thing with these with these new calf barns is there's curtains on the front and on the back, and it's plenty of air in there and get them into small groups like this. And the farmers have been pretty pleased with these. Um, they, they're all 
come together as a kit uh, and put together uh, by a group out of Pennsylvania. Uh, they are uh, pretty nice systems. Um, now we're gonna do something where I'm gonna show you what the brand was without saying the name. But I guess I can't do that because I can't find a sticker. Anyway, they're sturdy built out of uh, Lancaster County, I think. I've uh, been pretty pleased, like I said. Okay, let's see where we're going to go next. Okay, everyone. First of all, note to self. The gimbal does not really like the cold that well. And I think that's why it was bouncing all over the place on me. As I'm now in the office, it seems to be behaving a little bit better. So we'll show you some numbers. So first, this is just the uh, uh, monitor report from Dairy Comp. Uh, you can see, uh, if we look at the Feb 1st column right here, 777 cows milking, uh, 105 dry. Now, some of that dry also includes some, some uh, first calf heifers, or springing heifers uh, that are in that, the dry off, the, uh, dry, the close up dry cow pen. Uh, 84 pounds of milk, yeah, whatever. Okay, let's get down here to the bottom. Gathering interval, 372 days. Uh, you can see that's been pretty consistent throughout the year. Uh, actually down a couple days from, from peak earlier in the year, 374. Age at first calving, straight across, 21 months. Uh, average days open, bred cows, 97. Average time is bred on the cows, two. Days to first breeding, 63. And the palpation rate, 71. Uh, you can see we bottomed out that palpation rate during the summer, 64, 67%. Uh, slowly come back up. 97 cows fresh in January. Uh, no mastitis, no DAs. Uh, don't believe that. They're recorded in a different notebook. But the number of uh, called less than 31 days, six cows. Okay, so. This is some of the places where I start digging. Okay, that, that's just a nice quick overview of where things are, but let, let's really start looking at numbers. So here's the dead cow report. Okay, now the dead cow report to me is, is pretty interesting and, and most farms haven't expanded the, the, the car codes in Dairy Comp to really split this out. Uh, they, they, a lot of people stick with the default uh, values from dairy comp, which would be like the feet and legs, low production, breeding, sick, died, mastitis, and abort. Uh, this farm actually added uh, reasons why they put cows down. Um, and you can see if we look at that January, uh, nine, out of 51 cows that left the herd, uh, four of them were put down because they were sick, two because of mastitis, uh, four for aborts, uh, mastitis is is up there and we'll come back to that one and 19 cows for breeding uh, now that that uh, mastitis I actually see that because the other one that I like to look at to find the correct report is this one events so this is events for Lecrin zero for the month of January Okay, 115 cows fresh, eight were sold in the first 31 days, and there were three RPs recorded. The RP records are, are pretty good, I, I believe that. Um, it might be probably underreported, uh, like most places, but let's dig into these cows that were sold, because that's really, those are the failure cows. So if we look at the cows, just the reasons why they were sold in the first 31 days post calving. They have mastitis, an abort, a cancer, two died, don't know the reasons, two more, three more mastitis, another abort, and on day 32, there were two cows that, that were sold because of off feed. The off feed, um, we, we've, we've been really watching that closely because of this dry corn silage. Uh, and I actually, a couple months ago, added, when we, when we got into this corn silage and knew what it was going to be, I actually added, uh, oh, a bacillus product uh, that had some neat data showing uh, its relationship with Clostridia and like that. So, 
uh, I did actually, first time ever, folks, uh, done some, a feed additive like that. Uh, and I can say that, that just washing the hospital pen and these cows that have been sold because of off feed, I'm pretty well convinced that, that uh, it, it's, it's helping uh, uh, maintain uh, intake and cow health on, with, with these forages that we've got. But the big one to me is, you look at across those, nothing nutritional as to reasons why or dry cow problems. Well, I'll take that back. Nothing nutritional dry cow related, but the mastitis is an, is an interesting one. Why are, is the farm, did the farm see a blow up in fresh cow mastitis? So that would be something that I would throw out and discuss with, with management. Okay, now, I always get questions on, uh, well, let's do this one first. So this is just a little report that I put together called Tom. <laughs> uh, so it's by lactating group, uh, cows and pen, age, lactation, yada, yada, yada. Um, and I will tell you that, that our milk is down. Uh, we're down a couple pounds at least uh, with this dry corn silage, uh, but components are up. Uh, so our, our energy corrected milk is still around uh, 41, uh, 42 liters. Uh, so 91, 92 pounds, we're, we're holding pretty consistent there. And that, that's pretty good levels for, for uh, where the farm is. Uh, pounds of components, we're still doing, we're still meeting our targets. Uh, and since uh, we're kind of under a quota, uh, from our, our milk uh, buyer, our processor, uh, we're, we're able to main, we're main, we're not getting hit with, with quota charges. So, other things that I look at. First, people always ask me, boy, with that age of first calving, what, what the peaks look like. So this is just for the first calf heifers. Okay, age of freshening on, on X. So we go from 18 months up through at 20, 25 months, uh, <laughs> uh, and those, for, so over the last uh, year, those are the individual cows by their age of calving and what their peak production was, and you can see there's no relationship at all between age of calving and peak production. Uh, and actually, you can almost say that those 20-month-old heifers um, may be a little bit better than the 21 month uh, age of first calving. Uh, but we will, uh, we, we, we've watched this uh, over years and uh, it's pretty consistent with, with uh, uh, across time. Uh, to give you an idea of the range on, on some of these, okay, so that, is, that those top heifers are showing peaks of like uh, 116, 117 pounds of milk. Uh, the bottom of the range is uh, uh, 34, 35. Now, what's going on with cows like this, heifers like this, without digging in and looking at them, hell, they could have been aborts, they could have been who knows what. Um, but, you know, we look at those averages, we're probably averaging, yeah, 85 to 88 pounds peak on first calf heifers. Not where I would like to be, but not super terrible. So then, last one I'll do is uh, lactation charts. Okay, farm has daily milk rates. So this is seven day milk average by days of milk, truncated to 450 days, just so I don't see anything that'll change the shape of the graph out here and compress all this. Okay, first calf heifers here. Uh, you can see we've got a pretty good range. You know, there, there's some variability in here. Uh, that's pretty normal. Uh, what I look at, when I look at these, again, I am a visual person. I, I look at a graph and, and can see a lot more than, uh, it, it just makes it, makes it easy for me to process this data. Other people are tabular people. That's fine. I don't care how you look at it. To me, it, it's I can look at this and make some quick, uh, quick assessments of what's going on. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at 
what's the slope here? Okay, how fast are these heifers coming up? What kind of values are we looking at here? And then if I was sitting at the computer instead of having a printout, I would be going in and looking at these individual animals. I'm looking for the outliers. Why are these girls only here? Why is this heifer, why are these four heifers low, uh, lower than their herd mates that are over here? Okay, what's going on that, that why do we really, if we were to plot this, and I've done this in the past with this data, we actually see that we have sort of two groups of heifers here. Okay, ones that come in, fly, and, and have great persist persistency, and then there's a, a subgroup that comes in and just never performs that well. And they are statistically, we can statistically pull out two separate groups like that. Been like this for a long time. I don't have an answer why. I, I wish I did. Uh, if we look at second lactation animals, again, I'm looking at the same thing. Uh, what are the outliers? Okay, again, look at that slope there. I love that slope. That's, that's almost a straight line. But what's up with these girls? Okay, what's up with this population? Typical reasons I see for things like this, that these could have been aborts, they could have been calved a, day, or a week early, uh, they could have, uh, they could have had mastitis, uh, they could just be outright failures. Uh, and really, you know, we, if we see a couple animals like this that are gonna continue, uh, should they be on the call list? Probably, because they're never gonna, they're not paying their way really, even at, at um, yeah, 65 pounds at, at 64 days of milk. No, sorry. Um, of course, we would love to see them all just follow a straight line, but again, let's evaluate the outliers. Let's see what makes these girls the failures uh, and see if there's something that can be done. Okay, third and greater lactation. Oh, just give me an idea of the top range on there. Uh, top half are 130, 130 pounds, second calf. Okay, mature cows. I didn't do by lactation. I uh, usually do, but being in black and white, it's hard to tell it apart. Okay, top range here is 146, 148 pounds of milk. Okay, and same thing. What's our slope look like here? Again, I'm seeing some animals that are a little bit lower, slower than I would like. And again, these outliers. And usually, you know, if I'm seeing, you know, four or five animals like this, it, those, those, those are, uh, we can typically explain why. Uh, could, be, could have been, like I said, a health event. Uh, if I, and they don't bother me. They, there's always exceptions. But if I start seeing a big cloud of points down here, then that tells me that, we've, that we have something failing. And it could be a failure today. Most likely it was a failure two, three, four months ago. Uh, and so let's go back and see what caused those. What I am curious about is watching how these numbers, and I didn't do this graph, maybe I'll, I'll go run it right now, but let's look at peaks by days in milk. Uh, and I think that's gonna show us some something very interesting, uh, especially with this silage that we have. Be right back. All right, we're back. And I just did three new graphs. One, and they are peak by days in milk. So each of these is, so let's see, first calf heifers here, for example, right in here, 266 days in milk. So these is where those heifers peak. When, so we're looking at peak over time, basically, okay? So what do we see? Do we see any common trends here? If we were to try and draw a line through this, we would probably, it would probably be shaped something like that showing us that, yeah, we are probably, we, we're a little bit lower on peaks um, now than, than we were eight months ago, nine months ago. And if we look at the second lactation animals, okay, we can kind of see the same thing where we do have a slightly lower uh, levels of peak now. Uh, probably not a lot, but Definitely, I think, a little bit lower. We look at mature cows. Uh, maybe. Which is really 
intriguing to me because I thought for sure with this really dry corn silage that we would be seeing uh, a pretty big deviation uh, and, and losing peaks. Uh, so that gives me hope that, that uh, uh, we can uh, maintain the levels of production that the farm's at and uh, we get into some better corn silage, maybe we can pop those peaks uh, some. Uh, always does kind of surprise you when you start looking at these as to what uh how much variability there are in these cows i mean we're talking peaks anywhere from let's see 86 to 152 pounds of milk um that's a but that's a function of how dairy dairy comp calculates peak uh, as well as the individual cow variability so i'm used to seeing high levels of vari variance like this again it comes down to Let's look at the directionality. Uh, other times that I'll do is, well, let me do that. Ah, just had an idea. Okay, so same graph, well, modified the graph. This is again, the mature cows. And now in this case, instead of looking at all, everything from day zero, I truncated it to days in milk greater than 45 and less than 365. Okay, so we're only looking at cows it truly are uh, post peak, peak and uh, peak levels. And I use the command to, with uh, the slash R to give the regression equation. So that's what this line is. This is the fitted line across all the data. And as you can see, there is a slope. So we are giving up and the slope is 0.036 pounds. So cows that, that from 100 days ago, actually we're peaking 3.6 pounds higher than the cows that are that uh, are peaking now. That is really what I anticipated. Uh, not quite as hot, and that's, I expected higher. Uh, I expected that we would probably be seven to 10 pounds uh, lower in peaks uh, because of this silage. So, not terrible, not great, uh, but uh, we just continue to feed it. We move on. All right. Um, there might be some other things that I throw at you. Um, I do have a list. I, it's called Tom's 20 Questions. Uh, when I do herd analysis, some of you have seen that. And it covers quite a bit of the things that, that, that we talked about. Uh, it actually starts with uh, asking the farm some questions about their mission, vision, goals. Uh, and... And then it goes through some questions like, are they doubling birth weight uh, by 56 days? Uh, what is the milk production of the first calf heifers as a percentage of mature herd? Um, things that, that, that are much more from a systems analysis approach. Um, maybe I'll throw that up as a, as a slide or two uh, when we are live next week. With that, folks, we'll be talking to all of you soon. Bye. With regards to Tom's 20 questions, he may have since refined them, but we have featured some version over the years in our Ruminations blog. I will link to the PDF in the archived recording of this video and provide links to the old blogs. Before we get started with your questions, I will introduce next month's webinar speaker, my co-host, and thank this year's sponsors. Next month, we will be joined by the delightful and multilingual Dr. Phil Cardoso. Dr. Cardoso is an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He received his DVM and master's degrees from the Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil and his PhD from the University of Illinois. Since 2012, Cardoso has established a unique program that seamlessly blends his teaching, extension, and research efforts. Phil's topic will be feeding for cows and calf success in the transition period, a behind the scenes view. I think he's excited to play with the recording toys we have sent. Additional featured webinars this spring will focus on sheep nutrition. Our first speaker is Masoud Aoun, one of the founders and present director of Adina, his talk will focus on lamb fattening in Europe. He will cover breeds, production systems, feeds, and formulation for those of you who are formulating for small ruminants. Mark your calendars for March 18th. 
A second webinar in April with Dr. Philippe Hassoun from INRA in France will focus on milk sheep. As you know, these webinars take a lot of work and cooperation. The webinars are organized and produced by AMTS USA and Global. We were pleased to host the morning webinar with Elena Bonfante, AMTS Italian distributor and partner in Dairy Innovations with Bill Prokop, who also joined us to provide insight and help with questions. In the evening, we were joined by our longtime collaborator, Paula Torillo of Fina, who hosts a series as El Webinar del Nutritionista. She received support from Rock River Lab in Argentina and is ably assisted by Paula Alanis translating. We also thank AMTS distributors who joined us in the evening webinar. From China, Sean Lee of Ansitech, Brazil, Marcelo Hens Ramos, director of 3R Lab, and in Russia, Vadim Bekchevnikov of Nova Lab. We are especially thankful to generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and to manage the program. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm & Hammer Animal and Food Production, Hashtag Science Hearted, the Canola Council of Canada, learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com, Adina, experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives, and Proteca, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are Ajinomoto, superior nutrition through amino acids, and Virtus, both of whom have sponsored us from the start. Forage Labs, Dairy Land Laboratory, and Dairy One, with affiliates around the world, Adiseo, Rumen Nutrition Solutions to ensure animal performance, and Micronutrients, Feeding the Future. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Origination Inc., Phileo, Bulkem, and The Milk Group. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide. We hope that you consider them in your formulation decisions. I have added the question and answer session from the morning and evening webinars. We have excerpted a short segment on Tom's 20 questions that he led off both discussion sessions into a short standalone segment on our blog. Tom and Bill and Elena, unless you want to talk more in these areas, we have some questions that are referring to um, the program, but I want to tackle some questions from Akira before we go into the program. Um, Absolutely. Hi, Akira. He can't say hi back, but I'm sure no. he is. <laughs> He's probably swearing at us. Probably, yeah. probably. So his, yeah. his comment is, the calves look really good. Yep. He's wondering, what are the temperatures, summer and winter? <laughs> and, and then he's going to get into the nuts and bolts of, of what you're feeding and what your growth is during different seasons. Yep. Okay, so when I saw Akira throw that question up, I brought up quick uh, some data for what the ranges are. Uh, our, our warmest would be July and August, uh, average highs of 26 degrees C, uh, and our coldest is January and February, uh, where we'll be minus 10, minus 11, our average lows. Um, so we have a, 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 a pretty good variation throughout the year. Uh, and not only that, when we look at precipitation, uh, you know, you can see this is number of days of precipitation uh, per month. Uh, in this case, rainfall. If we look at snow, uh, yeah, it, it's Pretty much, uh, if you don't like the weather in New York, you wait five minutes and it'll either rain or snow. Um, so that means that we have high humidities during the summer and we have high humidities during the winter, which is a challenge because that's, we always talk about uh, uh, THI in terms of, of heat stress. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is there's not a, a similar term for cold stress. You know, we talk about wind chill, but, but if you are in a dry cold versus the wet cold, it's drastically different. Uh, our wet colds are terrible. It just, it just seeps into everything. Um, 
several years ago, God, it's probably been six or seven years ago now, we, we added a third feeding uh, because we were looking at performance of the calves uh, uh, summer versus winter and definitely saw that, that we were losing gains. Um, I cannot give you an average kilos per day gain Akira. Um, what I look at is, are we at least doubling birth weight by 49 days? And I do that because just the variability uh, in birth weights is really pretty high. It, it's shocking when you start looking at, at the birth weights of every calf, how, you know, we can be talking uh, full-term calves being anywhere from 30 to 50 kilos. Um, and, and we definitely see differences in, in how those calves uh, perform. We actually tend to see that the calves less than 40 kilos are typically around 2.4, 2.5 times birth weight. And the calves that are over that uh, birth weight uh, will be two to 2.2 times birth weight when the system's working the way that it's supposed to be. Uh, our, our new calf uh, manager, she hasn't been there long enough for me to uh, start looking at those numbers. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, just knowing how the calves are looking that, that we're gonna be back up where we belong, if not even higher, she's doing that good of a job. Um, we feed three times a day, as I said, uh, for the first, the first three feedings are, the first feeding's colostrum, the next two feedings are transition milk, and then they go on to three times a day feeding. Uh, up to 21 days, it's three quarts of, of uh, milk in the morning and in, in the evening, and two quarts of milk replacer at noon. From 21 to 48 days, it, they go up to three, uh, four quarts in the morning and in the afternoon and in, in the evening, I'm sorry, four quarts of milk morning and in the evening and two quarts of milk replacer at noon. Um, after the first winter of going to three times a day, uh, I was joking around with one of the farm owners that once you start this, you're, you're just not going to stop it. And when we were looking at the data, he's like, yeah, we're just going to continue, continue this three times a day feeding year round. Um, it is not pasteurized milk. Uh, and, I, and we don't use a balancer or anything. Um, I, the next step that I want to try uh, is because we do see some, some issues yet with calves. And I don't think our performance is really where we could be. Um, I was going to tr going to try this a couple of months ago, but we put it off till we had a, had the, the labor situation corrected. Uh, I'm going to try adding uh, uh, a specific yeast product uh, that that is in a liquid form that that has some really cool data uh, as to what it does to binding uh, E. coli and salmonella. So I'm going to see if, if we can use that as a replacement for pasteurization. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. Tom. Yes. I know you worked quite a bit to develop a milk replacer. Um, are you not feeding that on that farm? It's being- Oh no, we are, we are. Okay. I wasn't gonna go down that path. Uh, it, it, it's uh, just because uh, that, that always opens up discussions uh, with Akira. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> okay. He knows well, what I'm thinking, I, given, given the meeting we had last week with um, a group, and I'm thinking we need to look to consider some more 
CAF based webinars, maybe in 2022. Um, okay. so, so there's a panel okay. there. Akira had a, a sort of comment. Um, Can I ask one question just to clarify? Are yeah. These, so are these milk replacer feedings or waste milk feedings or 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 milk from the tank feedings? What what are the what is the source of the milk here? Okay, morning and night. It, it's it's a combination of of waste milk and and that would be uh, primarily uh, fresh cows or cows that are off treatment, waiting for their milk to be clean to go back in the tank. Mm -hmm. And if there's not enough of that, it's milk out of the, out of the tank. Uh, the noon feeding is milk replacer. Got it. Is this a, is this a closed herd with no Yoni's risk? Yes. Okay. Well, um, minimal Yoni's risk, we'll put it yeah. that way. From Akira, he's seen uh, many dairies with winterborne calves that were slow growth rate in the winter and seemed to relate to a late first calving. Some farms showed lower production in winter born animals. Um, do your cows, um, do your cows show the difference between animals born from heifers or multiparous cows? Wow, that's a good question, Akira. I've never, uh, I've never gone back and looked at that. Um, I'll, I'll have to dig into some data uh, and, and, and look at that. You have a year. Mm -hmm. All right, should we move to some questions um, from that are related more to um, formulation? Let's go. Well, one more cat okay. question. Okay, go right. ahead. Um, are you not using blankets on the early calves for a reason? Or, nope. you, or would you think that wouldn't we uh, decrease maintenance costs by putting a blanket on those, those young babies and maybe get more growth out of them that way from what we're feeding? Um, Maybe, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, you get like when they're in the hutches, you get back in there in the hutches and between, uh, because every hutch is, is, is uh, bedded initially with sawdust and, and, and a little bit of straw uh, and you get back in there and it's warm. No, I was thinking uh, of the ones in the, in the, uh, the new the calf barn configuration. The ones the that new were calf all... barn, it, it actually it, it it's it's surprising how how comfortable it is when you get back into those the back of those pens, uh, especially with the curtains up. Um, I I don't know if it would be a significant uh, improvement though. Okay, I was curious because yeah, we yeah, blanketed no, them for the first question, two weeks. I I don't know. I don't know. We've never tried it. Okay. Is those new hutches are group housed, right? Uh, they are individual pens of, and then uh, they can be merged into groups of three. Okay. Uh, should should any more calf questions, or should we move into um, no, cow let's, formulation? Let's keep moving. Let's keep okay. moving. Okay. So I'm going to look at the question that we have in our window. Um, you said your fresh cows are pl fed plenty of starch. What is the difference in ration and housing between fresh group and the group of cows that go into, they go into afterwards? Ah, uh -huh. okay. So what I do, and, and I, I've evolved on this over the last several years, is, oh, let's go to the close-up diet. And you will see that my close-up diet is da, 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 da. I am at just uh, just sixteen point eight percent fermentable starch. Okay, and forage NDF is a percent of body weight is 0 0.71. And it there's some straw. Uh, corn silage, some that, some grass silage, and then they they go from here to the fresh diet, which is basically the same. Uh, let me make sure that I have. Hopefully, this is right. I don't think that is right. We'll see.
Yep, nope, that's right. You're going to a diet that has that. It's not right. Oh. It's not right. Don't worry. Probably pretty close. Yep. Okay. Even though this says first calf heifers, it's actually the same diet I use on the fresh cows. Uh, the only difference is the fresh cows have 400 milligrams of menensin in it. Uh, as do the uh, close-up dry cows. Uh, so they're gone from 16.7 to 21.7 fermentable starch. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the number that I watch. I watch what is that spread between in fermentable starch between close-up and fresh. And as, as long as I'm no more than five, maybe five and a half units different than these girls can come into these diets and, and just eat and, and, and do well. Um, that's based on a compiled, compiled data that, that uh, Heather Dan and, and Tom Overton did. It was presented at the Cornell Nutrition Conference, oh, three, maybe four years ago, um, where, where they looked at, at uh, different starch levels across diets and like that and and saw that when we have this shift in fermentable starch uh less than six units five six units between close up and fresh uh these higher starch fresh cow diets actually perform better than lower starch fresh diets um so it's, it goes back to that close-up period, not just being uh, uh, related to DCAD and energy balance and everything, and, but also to an adaption period for the rumen uh, to handle higher starch levels, which is kind of neat. It, it, it kind of came, you know, we didn't come full circle because we're still controlled energy. It, it's just, how are we... How are we supplying that energy uh, and ensuring uh, adequate MP levels? So, so they come onto this and then they go on to, uh, if they're going into one of the high cow pens, they're going into this diet, which is not very different. Um, 21.9 fermentable starch at this point. Um, so the, there, there's, there's really somewhat minor changes between the, those diets. Um, and again, I just kind of have evolved this way. If anything, where, where I've made more adjustment and my thinking has been in those, those that fresh cow diet uh, and, and adjusting those fermentable starch levels. Um, and, and I, I, I really, really believe that if we take that into account, uh, that, that spread in fermentable starches, we really don't need a, a fresh cow diet per se, uh, a fresh pen. Okay, fine. That that's a management decision. Uh, but to have a, a, a separate diet, I don't know, I don't believe anymore that, that it's really, that it's, that it's, that it's a requirement. It, it's, it comes back to how we formulate that, that close up and, and uh, post freshening diet. Uh, Bill or Elena, do you, do you have any thoughts in this area before we new, move to the next question? Uh, basically use the same philosophy and, um, you know, target MP with a, a low fermentable starch level, but the transition into the 
fresh cow is, you know, the delta is five points, more or less, not more than that. So, that, you know, I agree with Tom. I think that's the, that was the surrogate that was un unknown when we used to have fresh cow diets that were, I'll put in quotes, safer than the high lactation diets. But once we understand, again, the model strength is understanding the site and, ex and extent digestion. Tom, do you consider the total starch at all or just the fermentable starch? I, anymore, I just look at fermentable starch. Uh, and, and even when I'm optimizing, you know, the, the numbers that I'm watching more, Elena, are, are, I don't even really watch NFC anymore. And I don't really even watch PENDF. I, I'm watching PE carbohydrate C. Uh, mm -hmm. And fermentable starch are, are my really my, my driving factors on on um, on the carbohydrate side anymore. Uh, thanks, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and you you just covered one of my next questions that I had about PENDF. What do you do instead? Um, Let's move to what, this is a question from Andrew, the maximum ME percent required that you run on a pre-fresh diet. Ah, that is a great question. Uh, and let's look to see where I am before I make a fool out of myself. <laughs> I try to keep it. I really try and keep it between no more than 105%. Uh, and here I am 106%. Uh, but also at this time of year, let's see, dry cow barn, let's make these temperatures more realistic of now. Yeah, still says 106. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, this is a, so this is actually a little bit higher than I like. I, I really try and keep the, these close-up cows between 100 and 105 percent of ME required. Uh, I'll never, I'll, I'll never let them go too low uh, because that's definitely asking for problems. Uh, and I also believe that if we get them too high, that that. Uh, we start seeing this days to change condition score start getting up too high or too low. You know, if we suddenly we get that days to change down, you know, like 100 days or 75 days, um, we pretty much can guarantee that, that we're going to be losing dry matter intake on, on, those, uh, on those fresh cows. Uh, so it's a pretty fine balance to ensure that there's enough fermentable starch, enough MP, while maintaining a high level of forage NDF as a percent of body weight. Okay, Th thank you. <laughs> um, next question I'm gonna ask is, what are the CHO B1 KD values that are using for corn silage and corn meal? Okay, so the corn silage, it's calculated off of uh, whatever the seven hour starch coming back from the, uh, from the lab is. Uh, so on this one, uh, see it was only 69% uh, seven hour starch for amenability. Uh, so 16% per hour. Uh, the cornmeal, uh, I would like to say it's an analyzed value, but I can tell you that it's not. Uh, it's just having an idea of, of what our corn like is around here and, and, and such that I've got it in here at 65% seven hour starch. So that's a 15% per hour rate. Uh, that's going to vary pretty damn heavily where we are in the world or even within the U.S. as to what those seven hours are going to look like on dry corn. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Holger in Germany. He has um, 
21.5 PENDF percent of dry matter for high yielding cows combined with uh, PECHOC with 5% in the dry matter, might the higher fiber digestibility cause lower levels in the NFC starch? Mm -hmm. What? Um, Okay, so first, that's a that's a that's a bit of a tricky one because to be at around five percent PE CHOC and twenty one point four whatever it was PEF PENDF. He is using a fair amount of grass silage um, that the particle, the chop length of that grass silage is going to, to come into play heavily on, on what we can expect on intakes on those cows. So, uh, and then it's also, it could be really high acid grass silage. Uh, so the NFCs could be really, could look really interesting on grasses like that. Um, it, it gets interesting that, that, and that this is a, this is a really good point, especially for the areas of the world that feed decent amounts of grass silage or high amounts of grass silage and that grass silage is really good quality and is high in acids. You can't, it's typically really difficult to go to the same levels of starches and fermentable starches that we can feed. Um, I, I, I have observed and I have heard from, from many people that if, we, if we're dealing with really high quality grasses and they are 10, 12% or higher lactic acid and you try to push these cows to 26, 27% total starch, the cows actually start to crash. Um, and, and that's just purely telling me that, that uh, we're dealing with an overall acid load of the rumen that, that is dangerous. So, and, and, and I, I should always, I, <laughs> I should always preface when I show my diets that these are pretty typical of uh, the Northeast, the upper Midwest, U.S., uh, and some places in Europe, uh, because we're prime, because we have alfalfa silage uh, going into these diets, and the in the overall buffering capacity is different. Uh, our VFAs, our lactic acids, are significantly lower. Um, the texture of, of especially the, these immature grasses that are across Northern Europe uh, being so much softer, they're, 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 they're just a completely different type of feed to, to work with. And we have to adjust those, those starch levels uh, accordingly. Um, and, and it may only be that on high cows, on high production, high, high diets, that if you were to try to do a 20, 21% fermentable starch, you could kill cows. Uh, you might only be able to go to 16, 17% fermentable starch. Um, it, it, it really comes back to what is the forage base we're working from. Okay, Th thank you. Um, it'll be interesting to see we have a webinar coming up in July 
with a veterinarian based out of the UK and if, if he'll have some um, thoughts in that area. Um, my question here from Jim is where might fermentable starch limit meal size um, in the a la Mike Allen's hot fresh diet? Can you, and this is sort of multi-step or he has multiple things he wants to ask. Can you get away with a higher Delta with, with high straw close up diet relative to longer retention of UNDF through calving and for several days, uh, more digestion ah. with higher straw diets. Okay, so this, these the studies that, that, that um, it, it's interesting, Jim, um, because if you go through Mike's data, uh, sometimes they saw a, a, an intake reduction and sometimes they didn't. Uh, and that is what motivated uh, both Heather and Tom uh, to do study, to do trials. And in Heather's first trial that, that she did and, and, and presented at CNC several years ago, uh, it definitely uh, uh, supported the, the idea that, that uh, a, a going to a high starch fresh cow diet uh, reduced intake and reduced milk. When Overton's group did it, they didn't see that. Uh, they actually saw that the high starch diet outperformed the moderate starch diet in the fresh cows. That's when the two of them got, got together and, 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 and pulled their data and saw that the difference in starch content in the close-up diet was significant. I wanna say it was like three or four points different uh, between the, the minor trials and, and the Cornell trials. When they took that into account and, and looked at the fermentable starch levels then, that's when they, that's when they saw that um, we, have to, we have to keep that, that, that change in, in fermentable starch uh, at a moderate level. And going with, with these lower starch, higher uh, straw type diets, um, actually from uh, taking their data and, and, and from what I've observed uh, both in diets that I do myself and in, in working with people in various places, they don't work as, they don't work as well. Um, and, and I think if we go back to that, that the original concept of the Goldilocks diets, uh, one of the things, and, and, and Bill can jump in here, one of the things that, that, that never gets talked about is um, really what do those fresh cows do and, and as well as the high levels of, of, of RUP uh, and, and including a lot of blood meal that 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 are that were used in in those Goldilocks diets. Um, now it gets confusing as all hell because there was just a paper in Dairy Science from Drakeley's group that that looked at at the difference in performance and and everything uh, in a one group versus two group dry cow program and and then overall fresh cow performance. And, and they didn't really see any difference. Um, I haven't had time yet to go back and, and dig through those, uh, through those diets to see what some of those shifts in, in, in uh, fermentable starch were between uh, the groups. They, they might've been close enough that, that they might not. I, I think it, it's, uh, I, I, any more, uh, if, if I'm dealing with, with a, a high straw diet and, and I see a big starch differential, uh, I, I'm addressing that uh, and almost to a, to 100% confidence that I see better starts, better intakes on those fresh cows when, when we make that differential smaller. Um, 
a lot of cases where I have to do the opposite, where, you know, there's still a lot of places I run across that are feeding corn silage as their forage base in these close-up diets. And then they have run into all sorts of problems with fresh cows. Um, but that I think goes back to uh, insufficient forage NDF as a percent of body weight in those close-up cows. Um, and that's a key number for me. I, I really like to keep that over 0.75%. I really like to keep it over 0.8%. Um, because that, that, that ensures me pretty well that, that I've got enough of that, that's that NDF in the room. And that's going to last for a few days post calving, especially coming from these grass silages and, and straw. Um, and also ensure that I ha can have enough uh, fermentable starch in there to, to easily take these cows to a, a high fermentable starch uh, diet post calving. Anything so, you want to add to that, William? Yeah. No, I, I, I think your point, the first point about the Goldilocks diets, it's critical to know what the MP level is and um, <clears throat> there was a, a fair amount of blood in those diets to, to get the MP because the fermentable starch component was definitely on the safer side, right? So you weren't making bugs, you were, you were feeding bypass. Um, anecdotally, when the Fair Oaks herds were compared, say, to the Boss herds, at the same time interval where the Goldilocks diets were fed and a modified Goldilocks diet was fed, emphasizing more of, of getting rumen fermentation MP. Um, first of all, fair oaks have better quality forages. Uh, so that that's a confounder. But typically the, um, the boss herds would have faster peaks than the, herd, than the herds coming off the Goldilocks diets, but the Goldilocks herds had fewer fresh cow problems. And, and again, this is not a controlled study, it's observational, but it points to the, the weaknesses or the opportunities. I'm gonna use that word in both programs to understand um, what the drivers really were or are. But um, so uh, yeah, there's, the, they can both be made to work, but you have to know the limitations of, of each of the uh, systems, okay, so. Um. Thank, thank you both. Um, we have a couple of questions that are going to address cow inputs, but before we leave this screen, Tom, you spent quite a bit of time um, discussing how you, when you walk the cows, you spend your time looking at them, seeing what they're doing, not necessarily checking ruminations. While you're on this screen, can you sort of, um, talk about the research that Michael Miller did with you um, at Minor and how you, you together created the cow time management model and how you would look at that in terms of, of what sort of factors are affecting eating and rumination. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, okay, let me come back to that in a second, Marianne. Okay. Um, because I, I just want to follow up on, on one thing with, with this whole thing with, with, with the starch levels and, and like that. Um, if we look at, uh, I just want to throw up a reference quick uh, for people to go find. Uh, this is the paper out of the Cornell from the Cornell Nutrition Conference. Um, it's the title is Feeding the Fresh Cow. It was CNC 2015. Uh, and, and this is the one where they where Heather and, and Tom uh, merged the data sets uh, and look at uh, at, at, at the, the shift in performance and like that. Uh, it goes back and you can go back to, I think, do they have a graph? Yeah. Okay, so here's, we've got some of the graphs in here. Uh, I think that's from the, from the Cornell study. Um, 
So it, again, 2015 CNC uh, primary authors McCarthy. I'll include a link to that when I put up the recorded webinar. Okay. okay. Yeah, that 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 that's that was for me the uh, uh, the clarification point, and and that's when I made some adjustments and and that differential uh, between pre fresh and fresh start fermentable starch levels. Okay, so um, yeah, I. I <laughs> I'll put it this way, folks. I, I, if you want to count ruminations when you're walking through pens, uh, that's great. Uh, but you have to be consistent in your times that you're visiting those pens. Uh, and, and as long as you're consistent, that's you can do it. To me. To put it very simply, I'm pretty damn lazy. And, but at the same time, I just, I just read cows. I, I, I can't explain it to anybody. People that have walked cows with me uh, have asked me to, to explain what I'm looking for and, and a lot of the times I can't, it, it, it's just the, this, I've been around cows my whole life. It, it, it's just a, a, a it, you call it a sixth sense of, of, of what I have. Hell, even when I was an undergrad and we were on a farm tour, you know, I saw a cow laying out there with metritis and, and, and I told the, the dairy owner and he looked at me and he's like, ha, you want a job? Um, I, I'm not, a, I'm not really a people person. I, I'm much happier walking cows and talking to cows. Uh, so I, I can tell, I can tell a lot just from, from the way my brain works versus Focusing on, on counting numbers and counting things and like that. It, it's, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't explain it more than that. It's like having uh, perfect pitch, Tom. Yeah, I think it is. I, th I think that's a good analogy, Marianne. I, I just, I don't know. The girls talk to me. Um, now, one of the things that, that, uh, that, that is, it's been intriguing to me has always been that this, uh, uh, cow resting time, cow eating time. Uh, Rick Grant and I probably been 10 years ago, uh, tried to build a model uh, for that. And actually I know a farm that, that used that, that original simple model to make the decision to, to build a new barn uh, because of overcrowding. And doing some actual data collection using uh, uh, leg uh, transponders, we found that the model severely underpredicted the response. Uh, directionality was correct, but but the actual resting time difference was about fifty percent greater uh, observed uh, versus predicted. So we put it on the shelf, always dreaming of coming back to it. Then Michael Miller went to Minor to, to do his PhD. And one of his projects was to revisit that model and, and try to improve it. And he did. It, and it seems to be, it's, it's similar to what Rick and I originally built, but it's got a lot more data into it and, and it is a little bit more robust. Uh, and it's here in the program under recipe tools, the management model. So it includes things like number of milkings per day, uh, how much time there is, is per milking, treatment time, drinking time, standing and social time. It, it, it's kind of so drinking time and standing in social time are, are kind of hard coded into the cows. Uh, they'll spend 30 to 60 minutes a day drinking uh, and then they'll spend, you know, an hour or so 
just doing normal socialization. Um, so then it's a matter of what do we have residual from all that time to work with? Uh, so we can look at, at uh, you know, what are we doing for overcrowding? So if we take, uh, let's say 130 cows in a pen that's got 100 usable stalls, uh, and we'll say that we've got 100 foot of feed bunk space, uh, and that they are that it's a feed rail. Uh, so these girls have 888 minutes available per day for resting. And the break point in this is 720 minutes. Uh, if we get below 720 minutes, we're going to start seeing potential milk loss. Um, and, and that's also tied into uh, feeding frequency. This, this is a neat interaction that when we go back and look at this, the, what stimulates a new meal, the single largest factor is the delivery of fresh feed. Uh, second and third are getting ready to go to milking and coming back from milking. Uh, and, and anyone who's been in a pen when cows are getting ready when about a half hour, 45 minutes before they're scheduled to be milked, will notice that those cows all start getting up and go over, heading down towards the end with the gate and they'll go eat. Um, so those are probably the, the three biggest meal stimulation points. Pushing up feed has a really, really minor impact on stimulating a new meal. Uh, it's really just there uh, to ensure that there's feed available for them to reach when they decide to go eat. Uh, the feeding frequency one, we get, we basically from one to three to three times a day feeding, you know, we lose about uh, eight minutes uh, of resting time per increment, but then we go to four times a day feeding and we lose a lot. You know, there's over 100 minutes, 110 minutes difference in resting time of one versus four times a day feeding. It's just so disruptive in, in the cow behavior, in the cow schedule. Uh, you know, if we were dealing with, with a pretty severe overcrowding, we, we could probably, in, in their feeding, you know, they decided because of how overcrowded they are that, that they are, uh, that they need to, to, to feed an additional times a day. Uh, that, could, that could be pushing them over the limit to where they're, they're can be pretty severely limiting resting time and then milk. Um, it's a pretty neat little, little tool. Uh, and uh, it, it's really there to give some, some idea of, of is, is cow comfort in terms of overcrowding uh, or, or feeding management uh, a limiting factor or are other things related to diets and management the limiting factors? Thank you for going over that. That was... Um... It was good, a good conversation. Um, so now moving off the diet screen, and I'm appreciative of some of these questions. We have three that are very similar, and they're all asking you about um, animal inputs and cow and, and heifer weights. So um, one of them is, do you weigh them? And then the other is, what's the return on investment of having scales on the farm? And then um, one of the questions was just, can we look at your animal inputs? Sure, I'll bring up my animal inputs while I discuss the rest. Um, so for the cows, yeah, I got lots of groups in here. Um, okay, let's start with the scale question and let's go down the path of heifers. We know milk production in our lactating herd, and we use that to formulate later on. If we don't know body weight on growing animals, 
what the hell is our metric to evaluate our diets? Um, dairy farmer, I know, puts it perfect. Up until that heifer starts producing milk, we are in the, in the beef business. Our objective is to grow these things as fast as possible and, and, and grow them correctly. And the only way we can do that is by having body, body weights. Scales are cheap, folks. Hell, you know, even to evaluate calf performance, how, can, how do you know you're doing a good job with, with calf programs if you don't have body weights? You can, go, you can go buy a set of scales for a couple thousand bucks and, and, and move them around the farm and, and weigh heifers at, at various points and, and see if, if you're meeting those targets. Um, and especially when you take into account, when we look at uh, data from Cornell, uh, they went back, this was a few years ago, they went back and looked at the mature weight of the herd in 1992 versus, uh, or 96 versus 2016. The mature weight on that herd, and this is with this no purchased animals, the, a consistent breeding program, the mature weight on that herd was increasing about 1% a year. And there was uh, about a hundred kilos difference in mature weight. So suddenly our target weights for breeding and our target weights for first calving um, are drastically different if we're dealing with a mature weight of 1800 pounds versus a mature weight of 1500 pounds. Um, and we don't know that unless we measure it. At this farm, I'm damn lucky. I've got three sets of scales to work with for, for body weights. Uh, so I have body weights at birth, weaning, six months, first asterisk, breeding, and then about six to eight weeks pre-calving. And I watch those on a as, pretty damn closely. Um, I wish I had them for the cows. Uh, these mature weights that are in here, I probably do need to increase them. It's been a few years. Uh, but these were based on me going out and taping uh, a bunch of, of fourth and greater lactation cows. Uh, and my body weights, uh, within the cows after that are kind of of uh, calculated based upon uh, first calving weights, mature weights, and then where they are in, in terms of what lactation number, days of milk and like that. Uh, I would love to have a couple more sets of scales because uh, I think it really for the cows, because I think it really does add some uh, some great management touch points. Uh, and not to mention, and, and, and I'll, I'll bust on vets on this one all the time. How do we decide how much of an antibiotic to give to an animal? You know, let's take a drug like Draxin. That's how damn expensive. And the dosage rate on that is how many megs per kg of body weight, and yet we don't know body weight, so then we guess, and we end up either under-treating or over-treating, and if we under-treat, our, our probability, our success rate of, of, of cure is lower, so then we have to treat again, uh, and if we under-treat like that, that can help build resistance because the bugs aren't killed by it, so they can evolve. And if we over-treat, then we get into the, the situation of what the hell is the real withdrawal time on it, not to mention the extra cost. Um, this, this is, it, it just baffles the hell out of me that, that we don't have, have more scales on farms because that data, just from a day-to-day -day management standpoint is critical. Uh, from a formulation standpoint, hell, if I'm off by a hundred pounds on body weight, my, pred my predicted intakes are off by two pounds at least. 
and my maintenance energy and maintenance protein requirements are off by at least 10%. Um, so if we wanna really dial in these diets on, on performance and accuracy of our predictions, especially when we're dealing in times like this where protein prices are crazy stupid, the better we can formulate these diets and remove more of that safety factor, the more money that we can save uh, our, our customers. So that's my rant on scales and body weights. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All I can say is thank you. <laughs> so if we look at like my heifer weights, okay, so these weights are kind of averages on, on, uh, on those various phases. Um, that body weight on this, this is uh, two to six month, uh, two to five month age heifers. That's the average of that barn. Uh, and that is the average growth rate of, through that time period. Um, so I, I, I really try to get those as close as possible. It also helps with, with, with feeding management as well, because I, you know, we can give a, a pretty good idea of, of what this pen should be consuming and, and are we are we over or above that? And, and again, cost control. Tom, can you also talk about dry cows? <sighs> These dry cow weights are kind of, uh, again, they're, they're, they're best guesstimates. Um, and they're, they're, I know they're low. I know they're low. How do you correlate body weight to body condition score? Um, I'm actually working on a way that, that we can, we can calculate that. Um, I think it will help clean up some of our calculations as well, especially with heifers. Um, but it, it's, oh hell, I'm drawing a blank on the number. What is it, 120, on, a, on like a 1400 pound cow, it's like 120 pounds per body condition score. Am I even right. close, Bill? Yeah, that's about right, yep. It's a range, 120 to 140, something like that. Yeah. Um, but then again, that would assume that I'm going out doing body condition scores all the time, which I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, do you I, wait? I, I use my three-point score and, 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 and move on. <laughs> um, Practice-wise, do you weigh cows at dry off when moving into the dry pen? And if not, why not? Um, we don't. Uh, I would love to either that or get weights on fresh cows, which would actually be easier. Um, it, it would change. It would just be a shift in, in, in some SOPs on the farm. And I brought it up a couple times, but I've never really pushed it. So that, that's, I, I think I need to push it because I do need to get some weights on these mature cows again. Maybe before the November webinar. Yeah, I was thinking about that. That's actually very possible. Cool. Okay. Do, if nobody else has any questions um, for this morning, I want to thank Bill and Elena. It's great to have you guys back. And um, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. And um, unless I get a new question quick, we'll say um, good day and adios, ciao. All right. Thank you, everybody. And next month, remember, is going to be Phil Cardoso, and he's going to have some, answer some of your burning questions about transition cows. So that sh there were some things that Tom covered that maybe he'll we, he will expand upon. He's also. Hope so.
going to be taking a camera out into the field? Let's see, the first question, and, and I think you'll be able to sort this one out quickly is, um, would you do a shaker box in the morning and then a few hours later look at sorting? This was when you were talking about the amount of sorting going on. It is a great thing to do. Um, it, it's actually, I like to do it right when, if I'm going to look at that, it's going to be, what is the TMR shake like right when it's fed? And then uh, depending on how many times a day the farm feeds, uh, we feed once a day there. So I would do it, you know, right before, right before the next feeding to have an idea of the overall sorting. And if I wanted to look at it within day, yeah, I'd, I'd do it a couple other time points. Uh, the reality of it is, you know, for me, and, and it's, as I said in the video, I kind of apologize for some things because people ask me, I've had people walk cows with me and, and have said, tell me what you see, what are you looking at? And, and I can't really explain it that well. It, it's just, I've been around cows my whole life. I just see cows and, and see strange things. Um, so I, for me, looking at that sorting, I, I, I can, if I wanted to put an exact number as to what percent of sorting was going on, absolutely, I would screen it. A lot of the times I can just tell by their eating behavior how bad they are or how bad they're gonna be. And, you know, at that point, it's an issue, it's a question of, do I want an exact number or do I just want to correct this sorting problem? And to me, it's with the relationship that I have with my farms, I just want to correct the problem. And I don't need to convince them that, hey, look, there's a problem. If anything, what I'll do is I'll either go grab the one of the owners or one of the one of the managers and be like, look, this is broken. What are we going to do about it? Uh, or I take pictures. Uh, and I think that's something that none of us do enough of it, as nutritionists or in advisors. Dairy farms, farms in general have a pretty short term memory. It's what did you do for me today? And if we take pictures and can go back and be like, hey, look, this is where we were six months ago. Look at where we are now and or they come up with some crazy ass harebrained idea of let's do this and it's like hmm here's a picture of when we did that three years ago remember how well that worked oh yeah it didn't <laughs> so that that to me that's the type of stuff that i focus more on i'm again i am much more of a visual person uh so that that stuff makes sense to me uh so it, it depends. God, that went way longer than I thought for a simple question. <laughs> well, Tom, so this is part of, you know, the questions are almost better than the tour and the tour is stimulatory, but um, you'll appreciate this. My husband walked in the room while you were talking earlier and, you know, he's immediately starting to walk those cows with you because he, like you, is a cow man and, um, we talked about it this morning, that perfect pitch relation, re relationship to cows. Yep. yep. I mean, you can try to teach it, but it's not as easy for people who just don't see the way you see. You cannot teach it. I can teach people about cows. Right. But I cannot teach someone to be a cow person. Right, right. Um, I'm going to move to one or two questions, and then I'm going to let Paula do a few, um, and then I'll come back to the questions I have. So um, I have some questions in my chat window from Vadim, um, and so he asks, uh, let's see, he noted your average herd lactation was 2.2. Could you please um, say what the call rate is, and what are the main reasons for cows leaving, leaving the farm? I think you showed some of that, but it may have been um, maybe yeah, a little deeper. It was on events, um, you know, on monitors. Wait, let me pull up. I got, I actually brought the printouts with me, which is rare. Hold on, hold on. You gotta get them out. 
Oh, called 39 animals called for January, of which 27 were cows. Um, we average probably around 30, 35% cull rate. Um, yeah, I know we do. Um, the biggest reasons somewhat vary by month, Vadim. Um, during the summer, late summer, when we have high temperatures, high humidity, uh, we'll see a blow up, we'll see some blow ups of mastitis. Uh, so those would be, uh, we would see those numbers go up for a couple months uh, as reasons. Um, the next would be uh, pretty, I think it's pretty balanced, repro and then voluntary calls on, on just, uh, of uh, these cows either um, are not getting along well in the barn or they're just uh, not nice cows. Uh, uh, there's not many feet and leg ones that, that are called for that, maybe just a couple of year. Um, and then, uh, Let's see, death is a pretty normal number is what we would typically see. Uh, I wanna say it's 10, 11% death loss, which if you look across a lot of herds, that, that's pretty much normal. Um, and they're spread kind of evenly throughout the lactation. Um, now, don't let that, 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 that 2.2, see, we're also in expansion mode, so it's, um, uh, so there's a fair number of heifers coming in, and I think we actually had a fair number of heifers calve in January that would have brought that down. Um, trying to see where on that report that would be. It's time to spread. Um, you know that the one pen that we were in that that uh, those old cows that I mentioned. That is an awesome pen. There's 120 cows in there. Let's see, pen, pen five. 123 cows in there. Average age is 64 months. Average number of lactations is four. Um, and that's that's really that's really the goal is how do we get more of those cows. Uh, Throughout the whole herd, because they're 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 the they're the money makers. Um, I should have done a picture of of the oldest cow in the herd. She just calved a month ago. She is. I think she's starting her tenth lactation, and she has produced over. She's produced over one hundred forty thousand kilos lifetime. Just an awesome cow, and, we, and we've got. I think there's three daughters, three family members. Th there's four generations of that cow herd, cow family in the herd right now. Um, and I would love to clone those cows. Just curious, Tom, how much does she weigh? Uh, she's a big cow. Uh, I'm not even going to guess. She's she's got to be near that 1800 range. Okay. Um, one more question I'm going to ask and then I'm going to let Paula ask a few and then we'll get to some of the other ones in our question. Um, do you use cal calcium supplement on fresh cows? And if you do, what is it? No, uh, I do not. Um, I do a moderate negative decad on prefresh and low calcium diets. And that's it. Um, actually, I'll sh happily show that diet. I just happen to have a program up here. I actually had close up cows. All right. 
So 3.6 kilos of corn silage, 3.7 of a, a grass silage specifically for cows, for dry cows and heifers, uh, two kilos of straw. Um, and when we look at my mineral balances, my DCADs negative 121. Uh, and my calcium, I, I'm 0.43%. I'm feeding in total 60 grams. Now that is higher than I have historically been, uh, but that's because I'm, I'm using a calcium salt of uh, primarily soy oil uh, for repro benefits uh, post calving. I'm, I'm only feeding it in the close up pen. Um, that, that bumped me up a fair amount in the number of grams of calcium that I feed. But post calving, no. If, if I show you my, what is basically my fresh cow diet, which is basically the same as the first calf heifer diet, except it has menensin in it. I am right at 100% of requirement on calcium. My, my belief is if you get these dry, these transition cow diets correct in terms of DCAD, methionine levels, rumen degraded starch levels, forage NDF as a percent of body weight, you don't need to do any of, any of that. The, any of that post calving drenches, supplements, I think is just band aids on an underlying issue that we can correct and we don't need to do it. How about jerseys? Same thing. Okay. Paula, I bet you have like 500 questions. Some of the questions Paula has put in the chat window. Um, okay. This is going to be going to back. Why don't you like to add water to the TMR when using a dry silage? Ah, okay. That is that is a great question. It, it's not that I don't like to. Um, I prefer. Oh, in if I had my choice, and if I was going to add a liquid to a TMR. My options, my desirable, desired sources of that moisture would be molasses or molasses blends first, or a good source of whey second. Water is my least desirable option. The reason for that is that water, it, especially if, if we're in a warm, dry environment, and if we only feed once a day, a lot of that water evaporates throughout the day. And, and you can see this just by watching uh, TMRs in the bunk throughout the day. And, and there's, there's just something about the, the behavior of that water when it's added liquid like that is not the same a, as water that's coming from silage. Um, there, there's just something about the behavior of it being an internal water source versus an external water source. And I, um, I I'm prefer- gonna, John, I'm going to interrupt just a second to make sure you incorporate this in because you started to talk about it. The low temperature also is that a factor? Uh, okay, I will. Um, the other is yeah, the, the big reason I like the molasses or the ways is they're sticky. So so they everything it just makes everything stick together so much nicer. I I, I much prefer doing that. Uh, if I have no other option but adding water, then I'll then I will. Um, now, why haven't we added water in this case? First, we don't have a liquid application system, so we would have to put in tanks and pumps and everything. 
And then when you start dealing with tanks and pumps and minus 15 degree temperatures and wind and everything, wow, we, we, you, we've just introduced a huge challenge um, that, that is difficult to work with. Uh, and, and we made the deci decision on the farm so when we went into this corn silage that let's see, since we've got this 2019 silage that's wetter, let's see what the cows tell us through this first bunk. And if we find that, that we can't manage it or we're seeing a lot of sorting or we're seeing if we see milk production start to drop, then we'll, we'll do a liquid system. But let's see what the cows tell us. Um, and it's hurt us a little bit. You know, as I said, we, we're definitely down on peaks. Um, but that driest corn silage, we are almost out of. Uh, we're going into something that's considerably wetter still isn't ideal, it's 47% dry matter. Uh, but I still have that, that 2019 silage to mix with it for now. So we're playing it week by week uh, and, and see what the girls tell us. If, if we can sneak through till, you know, even just another six weeks where it's not nearly as cold, doing a liquid system is gonna be a hell of a lot easier. I'm curious, and I don't want to distract things, but talk with Alice about um, her experiences in baking and cooking and the difference between just adding water and um, moisture within ingredients. It probably has something to do with that and how things I, I, mix. I, I think so too. I think so too, Marianne. Um, moving to the questions. Um, this is from Carlos. To prevent foot issues besides foot baths, do you add zinc to the diet? I don't go crazy high levels. Um, <clears throat> you know, if we look at, again, this is, so this is, well, let me go to the high cows. That's where most of the cows are. I don't, I, I add no niacin, no biotin. Uh, my zinc is, you know, this looks high of it at, for me at 160% of requirement, but the same protein mix and that has the minerals in it, I feed to the late lactation cows and it's only like, it might even be 95%. So I kind of balance it to, to try and meet as many of the, of the uh, to meet all the groups uh, across the herd instead of, having two different mineral mixes. Um, but there's nothing special there, you know, 70 PPM. Um, and that's saying it's 10% of it's organic and, and that is going to, I forget what form that is, but um, I try to keep these minerals like this um, balanced in relation to each other and close in as close to requ to requirements uh there's i don't think there's really any reason to be going to, to some of these really high levels i think it's a it's just a cost standpoint um now i will say yes foot bath so the herd goes through that herd goes through formaldehyde every uh every other day uh, at the same time, they go across the trim table three times a year, uh, and it's just maintenance trims. And those cows are, are on concrete forever. Um, so yeah, no, I don't, I, I keep, I keep things balanced and simple. Okay. 
Um, next question from Argentina is, if you have acidosis, do you fix the fiber to starch ratio or do you also add some buffer to the diet? <laughs> uh, um, okay, let, let me do the buffer side first. I, if, if we go back and we really look at the data on buffers, uh, the data on like adding sodium bicarb and seeing impacts on rumen pH, all that data goes back to the late 70s and early 80s and was uh, slug fed. So they put like 200 grams of bicarb on top of the, of, of the of the feed for a cow and she consumed it all at once. Uh, doing it that way, there appears to be, there is enough data to say that there is a, a, a change in, in uh, rumen pH. Buffers added to the TMR and, and I challenged some of the companies several years ago on this. If you take 200 grams of bicarb and you mix it with uh, uh, 50 kilos of TMR, of which 20 kilos of it is corn silage and has a pH of 3.5, how much of that bicarb is actually still there as bicarb by the time the cow eats it? Um, and the answer to that is virtually none. Uh, there, was, there were a bunch of abstracts six, seven years ago at Dairy Science that looked exactly at that. What is the impact of adding bicarbon TMRs? And most of them didn't show any response. I'm convinced when we get into doing bicarb and or other buffers like that, it's pretty minimal impact on the rumen. And what we're actually doing is manipulating DCAD of the cow and running the DCADs up. You know, if we look at metabolically what DCADs doing, uh, we're, we're in those acidotic cows and probably even Sara cows, they're ruminal acido ac ruminally acidotic, but they're probably also marginally metabolically acidotic. So anything we do to decad at that stamp from that viewpoint is going to help them metabolically. It's not going to really help the rumen. So the only way to correct it is work on the fiber side, work on the fiber and starch side. Um, but then I also, I, I'm a firm believer in, in having decads on these diets up at least positive 250 regardless. Because I think metabolically, we're pushing these cows to the edge. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that pretty much covered both. All right, um, Sean Lee and Vadim, do you want me to ask your questions or would you like to make some questions or some comments? Vadim, I know you spend an awful lot of time around cows too. If there's well, all right. Good. Yeah, definitely. Tom, I appreciate your presentation. It's awesome. Actually, I've seen lots of very nice cows. Clean, by the way, I'm impressed. And then a um, question is about the calcium. Like uh, we just talked about the bicarb. Do you add bicarb to your diet or not at all? Yeah, I, <laughs> actually, let's see. What have I got in there now? I, either bicarb or sescarb. Um that's how I got the, yeah, I got the decads up over 300 on this high cow diet right now. And I have, oh, 320 grams of bicarb going into that. There you go. <laughs> okay. Yep. Thanks a lot. Yep. Yep. I'll go as high as, you know, 0 0.65, 0 0.67 on sodium. Uh, and it, just to be able to run decads up that high. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tom. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from Sean Lee. I just have to find it. Um, oh, golly, it was, 
There we go. Tom, calf hutches versus sturdy built calf barn, pros and cons. Ah, huh. great question, Sean. Um, just so that everyone knows that, that sturdy built is the brand of, of that barn that, that the calves are in. Um, it, it's a group out of Pennsylvania. Um, it's, they basically make a kit and then come and construct it. Uh, it's all steel framed. They can come in and take them a couple of days to do the concrete and then they come back in and within uh, a week, they've got that thing all done. Um, the initial investment per calf is higher. Uh, probably three times the cost of, of a calf hutch, if not maybe lower than that because calf hutches just continue to get more expensive. Um, when the farm first started talking about doing one, I was not convinced. But after the first one was built and, and seeing the, the air quality, the ease of seeing the calves, uh, the ability to simply make small groups, uh, the ease of cleaning, uh, the, the long-term uh, uh, value versus calf hutches getting beat up and destroyed by skid steers and tractors on a regular basis. Those sturdy built barns are really, really nice. Um, I would say the biggest con is uh, the initial investment. Um, but again, uh, the, our fir the first one is now six years old maybe. And there has been minimal maintenance to do with it. Uh, beautiful, beautiful little system. Uh, the new one has a utility room in the middle that so a water hose can be used to reach all of them, all of the calves to, to fill, uh, fill pails with water. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think they're phenomenal. And I would much rather do that than any type of calf housing that is all indoor because the sturdy built barns, the airflow and the air quality is so, so much better than any calf, enclosed calf barn I've been in. I, I know we had a greenhouse and there were struggles. Absolutely. I know you guys had struggles. Yeah. Um, questions. Now I'm going to pull, pull some questions from the Q&A tab. Um, Angie wonders if it's possible to, the, to have the dairy comp report formats shared. What I will do, Angie, is um, tomorrow when I'm on farm, uh, Bill Prokoff's actually probably going to meet me there to, to go through some of this as well. I'll go through and, and run these commands and, and write them down uh, and then we'll share them. Great, yep. Yes, and everybody, I have put the link to the 20 questions in the chat window if you didn't see them, but also we'll, we'll share all this information when we send out the notice of the recording availability. Um, while we're answering Angie's questions, how long of a time does that milk peak by age at first calving um, look at? Gee, I'm not reading that well. Or is that no, for are. a year prior, more? Or that yet? is, um, that is all first calf heifers that are in the herd right now. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, it, it, it would be going back over the last year. Same true of the other lactation curves, the other curves by lactation? The, those other curves, I did them by days in milk. So that, that's actually, so the farm has daily milk weights. So these are seven day averages. Uh, and then it's whatever their average days in milk is 
on the day you generate the curve. Uh, so yeah, so the range on those is like from day zero to, I truncate them at, at 400 days in milk, uh, just so that that occasional cow that's out there 450 days or whatever, doesn't compress the graph and make it look bad. Okay. Um, while we're talking about lactation curves, is there any reason to compare peaks and not lactation production between first lactation heifers and mature cows? Huh, that's a great, that's a great one. What I have observed is if we look at, there's an interaction here with age of first calving. Uh, regardless of body weight of first calving uh, animals. Heifers that calve at 21, 20, 21 months, maybe even 22, tend to peak later um, than heifers that calve at 23, 24 months. So if, if I'm dealing with a herd that's got an average age of first calving of 24 months, um, I'll compare peaks. Uh, if I'm dealing with a herd like here that calves at 21 months, that peak is later and not necessarily as, as high as a heifer that, as a herd that, that calves at 24 months, but these younger heifers, their persistency is just the slope of the line from peak until close to dry off on these heifers, it, the slope is basically zero. Uh, they come up in milk and they just stay there. Uh, and, and I've seen that on multiple, multiple herds uh, that these, that's just something about the, that, that couple months earlier calving, that's just kind of what they do. Yet their lactation, their, their entire lactation milk production, when you look at that as, as a percentage of the mature cow's entire lactation production, um, falls right in line. Uh, if they're grown right, if they calve at the right weight, you know, we can be 80 to, 80 to 85% uh, uh, first lactation milk yield as a percent of third and greater uh, lactation milk yield. So there, there's just something interesting there with, with an age influence. Um, while we're discussing growth, um, how is growth being monitored in the herd? What are the average daily gains being targeted for each stage of growth? Oh... Okay, so we have at that farm, I'm super lucky. I've got three sets of scales. So I have body weights, birth, weaning, six months, first asterisk, or yeah, first recorded asterisk, first breeding, and then six to eight weeks pre-calving. And um, so my targets, uh, minimum double birth weight by 49 days. Um, and I'm actually, I, those, I, the numbers I'm getting, the body weight numbers I'm getting are actually at around day 60. Uh, so I, I'm looking at, at, you know, I'd like to be 2.2, 2.3 times birth weight as a, at a minimum. And what's cool about that is uh, on this farm, since we wean at 49 and I'm getting these day 60 weights, uh, my day 60 weight is including that post weaning slump. Uh, so I'm still achieving that 2.2, 2.3 times birth weight, even including some of that, 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 post, that post weaning slump, especially with the way that herd weans. Um, up through six months, uh, okay. So huh, how do I decide what do I have to do is really based upon, oh, doesn't matter which pen I take, um, at 21 month age of first calving and a mature weight of 750 kilos, um, you know, I've got to average from birth to breeding, I've got to average over a kilo a day. And then as bred heifers, 
I've got to average 900 gram, over 900 grams a day. Uh, so that those that's how I'm set. That's how I set my targets. Um, and I'm looking uh, so from weeding until six months. Uh, they're fed the high cow TMR, and we average damn near 1,200 grams a day average daily gain on those heifers. Uh, then we look at, uh, you know, we want to be around 400 kilos at, at breeding. Uh, and, and that is a decision that's made on every heifer when she's in heat, if she's 11 months, and if she's 400 kilos, uh, there's a very good chance that she's going to get a, get a straw semen put in her. Um, if she's only 370 kilos, we'll wait until the next uh, heat cycle. Um, so that, that's having that, that having those scales and having that weight there at first breeding is an awesome check for me. And if I find that, that we're a little low on weights, I'll go back and adjust those diets. Um, if we're a little high on weights, eh, I may or may not adjust them as, as long as body condition score is adequate, is correct. Um, and then my post bred heifers, um, they're kind of the biggest challenge because if we look at the, the energy and protein requirements for the first two trimesters, they're pretty damn low. So I, I'm actually targeting, I'm feeding them more like uh, uh, late gestation heifers to ensure that I've got, got enough protein there. Now, it's hard to, it, it's tricky to get those, to continuously get those, those gains correct, especially in the, those bred heifers. Um, here it, at this farm, you know, I've, I'm lucky in that all of the, uh, let's see, the yearlings, the early bred and the late and the and the, the, the later bred heifers have access to lots outside and they're on hills. Uh, and these idiots, it'll be minus ten, snowing, snow blowing, and they'll be out there running running up and down the hills, playing in the snow. So they're getting some exercise, which uh, helps me control that a little bit. The trickier one is in the summer, uh, two of the groups of heifers have access to, see each one is probably around eight hectares of, of pasture. So their intakes of the TMR go crazy uh, and maintaining the appropriate rate of gain uh, during the grazing season is, tr is probably the trickiest thing for me um, and, and the farm only views those pastures as giant exercise lots um, instead of actually managing the pastures correctly. Uh, really pisses me off because I think there's a huge economic opportunity there, but they don't want to, they don't want to get into good grazing, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, I, you know, 21 month age of first calving, basically I got to target a kilo of growth from birth until calving. And I check it with the, with the data that I have from scales. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to address some questions now. If you will go to your recipe screen, because that's where we're going to be next. We'll ask some um, diet related questions. And then I'm going to do a little bit on animal behavior based on the questions I still have out there. Um, so this is a question going back to the Argentinian questions, a question from William, what are your options to prevent ketosis when you see fat dry cows? <laughs> um, okay. I have a nickname for fat dry cows. Um, they're also known as dead cows walking. Um, <laughs> I will, I will do everything I possibly can to correct the diets uh, to eventually prevent the fat cows. But if I walk into a situation where I have a group of fat dry cows, the first 
several things that I do, okay? And we won't talk about management things other than I will make damn sure that that group is underpopulated. Um, if I have fat cows that are fat dry cows that are overcrowded, it is a train wreck. I automatically, uh, if the farm is not formulating, including methionine on dry cows, methionine is immediately going into those diets. Uh, and if they're really obese, I'll put choline in as well. Um, if possible, and I know this is not possible for in parts of the world, uh, monensin at 400 milligrams a cow is going into those. I, that, that is normal for me in pre-fresh and fresh 400 milligrams of monensin where I can do it. Um, if, it's a, if it's an area that, that, that can only use the, the rumensin boluses, great, make sure they're being used and make sure that they're actually going into the cows. Uh, and I may top dress a little bit extra on top of those boluses as well, because I think they only supply 290 milligrams a day. Um, and anything I can do to maintain intake on those cows, but nutritionally, you know, that, that, that addition of methionine to me is the first line of defense. Uh, there's, a, there's adequate data to really show what that does to the livers. Um, and then if I'm, and again, I'm going to say if I'm dealing with body condition scores over four, uh, uh, or, or if there's another stressor, say overcrowding, then I'll throw choline on top. Um, and that just really seems that that combination, uh, really does seem to, to, to address the, these these cows as much as possible. Uh, knowing though that we're gonna lose some of them. Uh, nothing is 100% success rate with, with fat dry cows. Um, next questions, uh, we have a lot of questions this morning about starch, I've got a couple. So um, the first one is, do you analyze manure for starch percent? And if what, if so, what level is okay or not okay? Okay, first of all, uh, where we are in the Northeast US, uh, our, our corn is uh, a little bit friendlier to the cows than the stuff in South America. Um, I do not routinely analyze for starch, for fecal starch. Um, if it's if I'm someplace where I suspect that there's a problem, or or you know if I wanted if I walked onto a new farm and I wanted to do a quick screening, yeah, absolutely. And if I'm getting over five percent fecal starch, uh, then there's definitely an opportunity to to do something. Um, you know, if anything, by having the, the, the seven hour starch digestibilities from the lab and incorporating those within the formulation, you know, I actually put together a report several years ago that calculates what fecal starch is. Um, uh, and you know, with, with the diets that I've got now, we're saying 6% which doesn't surprise me at all with how dry that corn is. Um, I, I, I pointed that out in, in the manure that we saw. Um, you know, I look at it as looking at fecal starch for routine analysis. I, I uh, to me, that's, that's looking at an end product. Let, let's look at it from the feeds, model the diets correctly and, and address it from there. Um, if we know that we've got crappy corn to begin with, you know, we, we can try and formulate around that. It's a, but the fecal starch is a great gotcha tool to, to, to do with producers. Okay. Um, in that dry corn silage, this is from Juan, what is the NDF digestibility? 
Oh, that stuff is actually surprising. Uh, let me unmix it since I'm feeding 50 50 the, the 2019 2020. Um, it is, and again, th this is just no special uh, hybrids. This is a Pioneer uh, hybrid. And <clears throat> 30 hours, 64 percent, 240, 74 um, percent. The only reason that that it's so dry is it was late being harvested, and we had frost that killed the plants. Uh, these plants were still completely green until we had a couple of cold nights. We were late planting last year. Was that a factor? No. Not okay. here. It, it was uh, um, there. There were same issue as as why protocols on some feeding things are not being followed. Oh, okay. In other words, it's a people issue. <laughs> um, while we're discussing uh, you the corn silage, do you use any additives? And if you do, why? Additives such as um, okay. Let me say this, okay. So the alfalfa silage is inoculated. The high moisture ear corn is inoculated. The corn silage is not inoculated. And going into this, when we were getting ready to go into this um, dry corn silage, I, I was really afraid um, that we would um, see that I would start to see an increase in the number of gut ups, gut aches, off feed cows, and hemorrhagic bowel. Uh, I, I was really, really worried about that because we have had issues with hemorrhagic bowel uh, on and off. So I did some digging around and those of you that know me know that I never use any additives. Um, but in this case, I, I found something and, and, and went through some of the, some of the data and decided to, to actually try it. And uh, it's actually part of the premix. Um, and I am. Um, I, I, I'm actually using uh, a product uh, that, uh, hell, I'll just say it, it, it uh, Baxiflex. Uh, it's a bacillus, um, and I am pretty confident in, in, in saying that it's doing something because we have not had, um, we've only had a handful of, of gut aches and cows going off feed, which surprised the hell out of me. Okay, a um, couple more questions with regards to diets. Then I want to I want to tackle that um, cow management tool. We've got some questions that can feed into that. Um, let's see. When selecting for better cows, do you consider feed efficiency or or milk yield? <laughs> Uh, I hate the term feed efficiency when we talk dairy cows uh, because what number do you want? Do you want it on milk production? Do you want it on energy corrected milk? Uh, do you want it adjusted for heat stress, cold stress? You know, we could have a day where we could have three days here in New York where the temperatures will shoot up to plus five degrees and it's been minus 10 and intakes will drop by two kilos. 
Uh, so do you want it environment adjusted? Do you want it days in milk adjusted? Um, and then there's a question of, give me a farm that can really tell me what the hell dry matter intake really is. Uh, good farms can tell me how much feed disappeared, uh, but that doesn't mean that the cows ate it. Um, so I, at this point, am not a pusher of selecting cows on feed efficiency or even talking about feed efficiency. Um, the only way I'll talk about feed efficiency is within a farm, within a group over time. Um, because there's just way too many other variables that, that I can make that number anything you want. Um, our selection at that farm is Yes, milk is considered, components are considered, feet and legs, utter composition, um, and stature and body size. You know, the, the farm puts it best. Their ideal cow would be basically a uh, 2000 liter tank on four stubby legs. <laughs> that has a muzzle the size of a scoop shovel that can just get up to the bunk, eat, 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 process that feed, go lay down, make a lot of milk, walk to the parlor, make and walk back and never have any problems. Um, so they're not the big showy, you know, runway model cows. These, these cows are, are being selected to be, um, Old, old cows that, that, that you walk into that pen. That's what was so funny when I was doing the video and those old cows wanted to, to nuzzle me because usually when you walk in that pen, they want to chase you the hell out of it because they want to be left alone. Um, that's the perfect cow. Um, question, as you are considering that you're, you're using up that dry um, corn silage and you'll be switching to uh, higher moisture. Do you think that the ruminal microbiota is adapted for that low water diet? And how will that affect milk yield at the herd level? Um, with, let's see, six kilos of that really dry corn silage in there uh, and still six kilos of, of, the, of the wetter corn silage. I think that the, the impact will be minimal. Um, I don't know, I could be completely wrong. Ask me that uh, in a couple months. Uh, we have a comment from Weben. He's impressed by the consistency of the fresh cow's manure. What que is, alguien está eh, uh, realmente impresionado on. por la consistencia del estiércol. I de have to meet Paula. Ay, voy Let's, a tener <laughs> Sorry, I have too many windows open. <laughs> Sunny, Sunny to have Spanish coming through at the yeah. same time. Um, <laughs> so impressed by the efficiency of the fresh cow's manure, what is the starch, rumen fermentable starch, NDF, PENDF of the pre-fresh and the fresh cow diet? Or just could you quickly show both diets? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Just, so, so happy he asked. <laughs> my close-up diet is forage NDF as a percent of body weight is 0.71%. Come on, it'll show that when it recalculates. Okay. And my PE NDF is th just about 35. PE CHOC is 11. And my fermentable starch is 16.8%. Magic number there, remember that, 16.8. They're going on to a diet that is got a forage NDF as a percent of body weight, I think 0.75. Ah, 0.83, ah, look at that. And a fermentable starch level of 21.7. Uh, 
uh, PE NDF of 20.6 and a PE carbohydrate C of 6.3. Um, as long as I'm, uh, that, that's, that's, there's a couple key numbers there. One is those close up cows. I really like to keep that forage NDF as a percent of body weight, ideally over 0.75. Um, 0.71 is actually a touch on the low side for me. Uh, and then my rumen fermentable starch, I will do everything possible to keep that differential uh, between the close up and the fresh diet, uh, definitely less than six units different. Uh, I'm five units different now. And I like that differential at five. Um, that's based on, I used to be significantly lower than that in fermentable starch on the close ups. Uh, several years ago, um, it started with, it was started with some of Mike Allen's work on the hot theory. And then Heather Dan did a study at the Minor Institute. And then, and then Tom Overton's group did a study at Cornell and they saw different results. Uh, but when Heather and Tom combined their data, they actually found that if that differential in fermentable starch from close up to fresh is like that five to six units, we can, go, we can take these fresh cows onto some pretty high starch levels right away and they, their intakes are great and their starts are great. When I saw that data, I, I came back and started looking at some of my diets and I was like eight units different. And when I brought that back down to six units, uh, I definitely saw an improvement in starts on the fresh cows. And I did that, I did not change the starch level on the fresh cows. I actually changed the fermentable starch level on the close-up cows. And wow, those, those cows, uh, when, once those cows started coming through, they definitely came through uh, with, with better production. And, and I think that's that, I think there's something to be said there. You know, we went way to the extreme of controlled energy, low starch, low energy, high fill, you know, the, 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 the typical Goldilocks diet. But what, what, what people don't talk about or realize with, with uh, those original Goldilocks diets, they were still really high levels of MP because those diets contained a hell of a lot of blood meal. Um, so as, as we've come back to somewhere in the middle you know, I still see really heavy corn silage dry cow diets, and those are train wrecks. I hate those diets. Uh, being somewhere in the middle here of being somewhat controlled energy, but also, you know, relatively high fill and high MP and, and, and having those amino acids formulated and then having this differential in fermentable starch, five or six units different everything just comes together on these cows really nice. And, and in most cases, I don't think we need a fresh diet. Having a fresh pen for management reasons, absolutely. I have no problem with that. But I think we can, uh, we can really push the, these fresh cows if we have the transition cow correct. And it just goes to show that that the rumen, we've got to have that, uh, that adequate levels of fermentable starch in there for the rumen to adapt. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of going back to some of the old thinking of, of we got to have a little bit of all the ingredients that we're feeding the, the lactating cow and the close up cow. I don't know if that's necessarily the case as much as it is, we got to have the starch levels right so that, that, so that those, that rumen's ready to really tackle that extra load. Okay, um, I'm gonna save Marty's question for last, unless I get more questions, but I've got a question about animal behavior. Um, 
why is it that cows choose only one part of the pen to eat? And this is regarding uh, compost bedding. They get all together at one end of the pen and they don't like the other end of the pen. And, and is it wind, gregarious behavior? She can't quite figure out what is going on. And they have to force them with an electrical cord to the other side to use the bed evenly. They use the same bed to eat and rest as well. All right, so here's what I have observed over the years. Um, cows do funny shit. <laughs> um, and when we look at, at um, because it, it drives me crazy even walking into one of, one of, one of our barns, beautiful four row barn. And there are certain times of the year when the cows all eat at one end. One of those, what's that time of year? Summer. And, you know, in some cases it's a fly issue. And for some reason, when there's really bad flies, cows huddle. Uh, when there's bad airflow, cows will huddle. Sunlight, if, if the sun's coming in on, on one part of the feed bunk or I see it even in stalls, uh, cows will avoid that area of the barn uh, during the summer when the sun's on, the, on that area because it's just too damn hot. Um, it could be, I've, I've seen this in some cases where there may be stray voltage uh, in one section of the feed, feed rail or, or headlocks that, you know, the cows are going to avoid that at all costs. Um, it could be, I've seen it as well, where the mixer is not working correctly and uh, what the cows are going and bunching up around and eating is, is actually typically higher, higher grain content. Um, it, I've seen it with airflow as well. I, I was just helping a, a friend do, who's doing a study and, and his treatment pen was not performing like he thought it should and when we walked in when I walked into the barn I just immediately started shaking my head because the control group was on the end of the barn that had better airflow um, his treatment pen was the opposite corner and it wasn't getting the airflow uh, that was one of one of several things that I observed there um, so it's, it's really, in, in a situation like that, I, I start looking at, at multiple things. Is, is, it, um, is it a time of day effect? Is it a access to water effect? Is it uh, temperature related? Is it sunlight related? Is it um, uh, fly related? Is it related to the mix? Um, Hell, in cases like that, I think one of the best things you can do is set up a trail cam and, and record the cows over a couple days and, and see if you can pick up patterns as to when does it start? Is it all the time or is it just part of the day that they're doing it? Uh, you might see something that, that jumps out at you right away. And then you can always write the cost of the trail cam off of your taxes as a business expense and then go put it on trails to find deer or whatever <laughs> the hunting is around you. Um, one more question before I'm going to ask you to open up the um, cow management tool, but uh, this question is, can you interpret fermentable carbohydrate as the carbohydrate fermentable in the rumen? Yes. Okay. That is exactly what it is. All right. Now, <clears throat> this is Marty's question. And, and I just, I was taken by how you covered it this morning. The cow management tool that you worked with Mike Miller and Rick Grant at Minor Institute. It's capturing some of the things that mm, are really, really important, but not diet related, but they're more cow behavior related. 
Um, how important is it to f deliver feed to the cows at the same time every day? And Tom, if you would open that and talk your talk through that, I thought that was an interesting concept. I'm actually, I think before I even do that, let me think, where is that data? Right there. Oh, uh, let me look for, let me see, let me. Home, where we were watching the skunks eat the cat food. Oh, did I lose that? Um, I think what is a beautiful thing to say, ah, oh, damn it. Huh. Um, okay. Let, let me, before I get into the management model, let me go through Marty's question because this, this is, this is an intriguing. Um, many, many moons ago, uh, and, and I'm talking probably 25 years ago, I didn't think it was a big deal. And I was helping a farm out that he would go feed cows. He always had a load of feed on the mixer. And when he saw that the bunks were low, he would go feed cows. And he was inconsistent on time, always. That was his consistency, was his inconsistency. And the cows were milking well. I mean, these, these cows were milking really well. Someone was there one day and, and told him the best thing he could do is pick a time and feed at that time every day. And by God, we saw milk go up, uh, as well as intakes. Um, and I didn't think much of it till, you know, really started observing cows more. And, and what I really, what I wanted to show, but I can't find the pictures quick, is cows crave consistency. Cows love consistency. If, if you're in a, in a pen of cows and it is an hour before milking time for them, you'll see them. They'll start to get up. They'll, 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 you'll, you'll be in the pen, and ninety percent of the herd will be laying down, of the group will be laying down, and suddenly it's like an alarm clock went off. You just see these girls start getting up. They'll start wandering down. They'll get a drink. They may go eat. Probably will go eat, and they'll just all go start wandering, get closer to the gate, so that by the time it's within 10 minutes of, of the gate being open for them to go to the holding area, 85, 90% of the group is there. Um, and and that, that just really reinforced to, to me how much cows crave this consistency. They, they, they expect, we, and we've observed this even in feedlot cattle, you know, we could go into to a hundred thousand head lot where you know there's multiple multiple loads of feed fed a day uh and those pens those cattle know within 30 minutes of when their feed is supposed to be delivered you will see them come up they'll start coming up and standing by the feed bunk waiting for that load to be delivered um some of it, I think, is related to they recognize uh, uh, the sound of the, of the mixer and they kind of know it's really cool to watch them. They kind of know where that mixer is in, in, throughout the day that you see them suddenly. Oh, OK, he's feeding that pen now. Uh, there's one more pen before us. 
uh, and, and, and they just get trained to that. And, and you throw them off schedule from there and it is really, really disruptive to the group. If you're an hour late, suddenly you see all those cattle up at the feed bunk just screaming and beating on things and beating on each other. And God help you if you go in that pen. Um, so I, I think we, in general, undervalue the, the schedule that a cow is on. Uh, and that's actually a great segue into this new management model. Uh, it's here under recipe tools. It, this is something that, that Rick Grant and I started working on over 10 years ago. And I built the first little model and it looked great. And, and we actually had a, uh, a barn built based on, on, uh, on what it was predicting. Uh, but we were able on that on at that time to put data loggers on 20 cows before and after um, they got moved into the new barn, and we underpredicted the resting time response by 50 percent. Uh, these cows, there's definitely a break point in how much resting time they need. Um, so I put it on the shelf and, and Rick put it on the shelf too. And then several years ago when Michael Miller, who now works for uh, Trow Animal Nutrition, he, he started his PhD at the Minor Institute with Rick. And one of, one of uh, Michael's projects was picking up this management model and trying to improve it. A lot more data that, that he was able to put in. Um, and, and the predictions look pretty damn good. Um, so it includes, you know, there's only 24 hours a day. So, you know, how much time are they, how many times a day are they milked? How much time are they in the holding area in the parlor for each milking? Treatment time, you know, depends on that. I think that's a combination of not only being outside of the pen, but also being locked up in headlocks. You know, that's something I see pretty routinely on farms is, you know, the herdsmen will, will lock up this group of cows and it, they may be locked up for two, three hours, uh, be it repro work, uh, treatments, vaccinations, whatever. These guys are locked up and, and that is taking time away that they would rather be lying down. Um, drinking time, it's pretty standard uh, that these cows will spend between 30 and 60 minutes a day drinking, uh, 60 more when we get into higher temperatures. And then they seem to have the, this basal standing social socialization uh, requirement of about an hour a day where they want to go visit their friends. They want to go groom, especially if there's brushes in the pens. Um, you'll see them just stand there and rub and rub and rub. And, and uh, it, it's the best way I can put it. And I'm sorry, but I have to do it this way because everyone will understand it. They are women. They need, they have a, a beauty requirement. Um, and I know I'm going to get hit by many people for saying that, but <laughs> I'm sure Paula right now is beat faced red thinking how she's gonna hit me the next time she sees me. Um, and then there's, there's the stocking density that's either based on, on the uh, length of the feed bunk or uh, number of stalls. And all those things really uh, dictate how much time she has available for eating and for resting. Um, and I'm going to come back to feeding frequency because it's a neat one. So here we've got a pen that's 30% overcrowded, uh, three times a day milking. They spend an hour each time milk, uh, out of the pen. 
so they've got 1125 minutes a day available for eating and resting. Okay, they're going to spend about 184 minutes a day eating. And that gives them 845 minutes a day available for rest. So in this case, the way this little tool is working, it's saying we're not losing any, we're not losing milk because of housing uh, or, or, you know, time. Uh, and, and actually we're giving up, about, there's about 2.8 kilos potential more milk sitting on the table for other reasons. But if we take and, and if we say, okay, you know what? We are in expansion mode. We are going to run these pens up to, you know, 170 to 75% overcrowding. And suddenly we see, well, hell, with one time a day feeding, we're still okay. We're still at 807 minutes. And I've seen farms do this. I've seen farms go as high as 200 or yeah, 200% uh, stocking rate when they're in expansion mode and make it work. Okay, 760 minutes a day of resting time yet. They only fed once a day. If we feed twice a day, we've lost five minutes. Three times a day, another 10 minutes. But by God, if we go to four times a day, feeding, suddenly we are deficient on rest and we're, we're losing, we're potentially losing three kilos of milk a day because we have sucked out so much resting time. Um, so I see this quite a bit in, in parts of the world where people look at the, the cost of a mixer and go with a smaller one and decide they're gonna feed four or five times a day. And I'm telling you folks, I think that is hurting a lot of herds. Um, I, that we know the, the largest, the single largest motivation for a cow to come up and start a new meal is the delivery of fresh feed. And any, any time that mixer comes through, it is disruptive. They're gonna get up and they're gonna come and eat. And they can't help themselves. They're, they're, they're junk food addicts. Uh, you, you wave a bag of potato chips in front of anybody and they'll drop what they're doing and to go follow you. It's the same with cows and that mixer going by. So I think to me, there is no reason to be really even twice over twice a day feeding. Uh, the, the data is pretty clear as to what that's doing to interrupt resting time and, and feeding time and feeding behavior. Now, I will say this data is free stalls. There is very, very, very little data out there uh, that's been published with dry lots and Rick and Michael were trying to get their hands on a large data set that Novus has uh, to try and look at some of this. And we haven't been able to get our hands on it yet. Uh, I know Marty has shown me some of the data that's possible out of uh, the new AFI system uh, that gives resting time. And from the little bit of data that's out there, it really looks like on dry lots, we should be probably, we can probably go down a, a 660 minutes of resting time maybe. Uh, but I, but again, that, that's a soft number yet. Um, I, I would still be trying to target 720 minutes a day resting time, even in dry lots. And, and that's an area where you know, I, I, I always have fun with it because we've done it this way for years with, with free stalls and tie stall barns uh, of going and doing the knee test on, on, cow, on stall comfort, where basically you walk into a stall and try and simulate what a cow does when she lays down, drop to your knees. And if it hurts your knees, just think of what it's doing to a flipping 700 kilo cow when she does that. 
I've seen that a lot in dry lots and I've seen really big differences in cow behavior in, in dry lots that were not groomed and, and were hard. And then when they've gone through and aerated those, those lots and made them softer, you see the cows actually wanting to lay down a lot more. Um, so I challenge all of you that work with dry lots, go do, go do the knee test. Uh, and don't cheat, don't do it after a big rainstorm when it's actually a mud lot instead of a dry lot, because that's a different story. All right, so Marty had a comment and I'm not sure I understand it. We need to get, be thinking about this again before it gets put on a warming burner. I don't know what that yeah, means. Yeah, absolutely, Ab absolutely, Marty, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we, we need to try and collect some more of this data. Hell, I've been struggling with this for years, even from, uh, you know, trying to figure out distances walked. You know, we look at some of these data loggers, they count the number of steps. But by God, try and find somewhere in the published literature as to how big is a cow step. I've only ever seen one publication, and it was looking at slatted floors and then putting filling in some of the slats with rubber filling and how that changed cow stride length. Um, it's gonna it's gonna become more and more important as we have more of this data captured electronically. There's so many more things that we can account for when when we do evaluations, when we do formulations, but we're missing some some key pieces of data to be able to accomplish that. Cool, cool. Well, um, unless I get some questions quickly, I'm gonna say thank you so much. Um, your, your question periods are always where we really get to dig in and I think everybody appreciates it. It makes for a long, long day for you. I bet you haven't had supper. I have not, I had a quick snack when I went home to help Alice take care of animals. All right, well, thank you everybody. I hope that we haven't just totally exhausted Paula and Paula. Um, and I'll, thank I'll, I'll leave everyone with a funny one to read. Um, there, there, people with dogs. <laughs> Marty, I should probably send this to you. <laughs> it looks like one of Marty's dogs. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, all right. With all of that. You know, thank you, everyone. And, and if you have questions, just just email. All right. We're here. And we'll get a whole bunch of information coming to you with the um, recording. Um, Tom, you're going to send this little you're going to make you're going to send a link to this for everybody, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to you. Marianne. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening and we'll see you next month. All right. Bye, everyone. Stay safe in this insanity world that we live in still. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everybody.